They come from the bowels of hell. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. I bought a dog that kills a cat. It's the Dana the Gould Hour. What is true? And once again, welcome back. Hello and happy holidays. I've got great news. 2020 is almost finished. And we are going out in style. But really, any exit would be enough, wouldn't it? We have two amazing guests today. Again, an old school style episode to go out on. Anne Serling is with us. Anne is the daughter of none other than Rod Serling. He, the creator of The Twilight Zone, The Night Gallery, the screenwriter for Requiem for a Heavyweight, the author of Patterns, Seven Days in May, and that eight movie we've mentioned. She has two books out now for your reading pleasure. The first is As I Knew Him, and it is an incredibly sweet and insightful story of growing up in the Serling household. It gives us a great insight into Rod Serling as a guy, as a dad, as a husband, in addition to as the famous writer that we all know, and what it was like to grow up in the late 60s in Southern California with a famous father who happened to be a nice guy and a decent human being. I know, hard to believe. The other book that she has coming out is called Night Gallery, The Art of Darkness, which comes out next month. It is a large format coffee table book with beautiful, full-color illustrations with all of those famous paintings from the Night Gallery with essays about each episode. The book was curated by Scott Skelton and Jim Benson, and Anne wrote the foreword along with Guillermo del Toro. So to get your copy of Night Gallery, The Art of Darkness, go to creaturefeatures.com, just like it sounds, creaturefeatures.com. To get As I Knew Him, My Father Rod Serling, go to Amazon or a bookstore. Even better, go to a bookstore. There may be a bit of a sound issue on uh, Anne's interview. It may sound a little tinny at first. Uh, There was a technical glitch, but we fixed it, and uh, hopefully it won't be too distracting. My other guest is a very talented and very funny Uh, Gray Delisle is here. Now, Gray has been a friend of mine for longer than either one of us cares to mention. Uh, You might not recognize her face, but you've heard her voice. In addition to being a very talented singer and comedian, Gray is one of the most successful voiceover actresses in show business. She is Daphne on Scooby-Doo. She's Catwoman. She's on The Simpsons. And Gray is going to tell us about her storied career, her crazy childhood, her many marriages, and other stuff that I am too bashful to mention right here at the top of the show. Gray is a hoot, and I'm so glad she made time to come by. So I wouldn't want to say naughty and nice or nice and naughty, but it's a... It's, it's a wide-ranging show we have. Uh, uh, and before I go, I just wanted to say uh, a word about uh, all of our Patreon followers. I want to thank everybody who signed on to um, our show's Patreon. This show has a very high overhead because it has a lot of production, but that's the show I want to make, and I make it with uh, a small group of incredibly talented people. And uh, they all deserve to get paid for their labor, and they do. And the Patreon really helps me keep the show going um it's five dollars a month you become a dana gould sky cadet and for that you get all sorts of uh extra video content you get extra interview tracks per show uh there's a lot coming up there's two things i wanted to mention that i've got coming up before we go so anyway thank you uh patreon if you want to sign up go to dana gould.com and just click on the banner and uh, and sign up it's five bucks a month we don't have you know various levels for $75 I'm not going to come to your house and give your grandmother a home perm five bucks you get some stuff uh, two things that I wanted to mention uh, one for December uh, I wrote a movie that's uh, going to be on sci-fi on Christmas day called Toys of Terror it's a very fun movie about toys that kill you uh, the premise was uh, what if the island of misfit toys was a horror movie 
it developed from there. It's on uh, Sci-Fi. I think you can stream it now, but it's airing on Christmas Day. That'll be fun for the family. Toys of Terror. You can see the old trailer online. And uh, coming in early 21, uh, late January, early February, Hanging with Dr. Z, a certain orangutan elder's lost talk show from the 70s, will be appearing for your viewing pleasure. And we will have more information on that next month. Uh, and if you're in the Patreon, you can uh, see some backstage, behind-the-scenes footage uh, probably this month. So there you go, danagool.com for all that stuff. But enough of my yakking, as Marty DeBerge once said. And now it's on to our filthy Yuletide business. <laughs> Gould Hour. Free and worth it. Really happy to welcome my next guest. She wrote an amazing uh, memoir that I highly recommend called As I Knew Him, My Dad, Rod Serling. And that is available. I tore through it in one in one sitting. It's 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 such a beautifully written book, and uh, she has a, a contributed to a new book that's just coming out uh, called Rod Serling's Night Gallery: The Art of Darkness, which is a compilation of all of the artwork that you remember from the Night Gallery, and of course a lot of great behind the scenes stories from the making of the show. Guillermo del Toro wrote an introduction, and uh, my next guest also wrote an introduction. Please welcome. Anne Serling. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. My pleasure. Thanks for having you. Now, okay, so here's the here's the the first thing is this is this is our Christmas episode. Uh, your dad was born on Christmas. Now he's Jewish. That's right. They still celebrated Christmas. You say, or he did anyway. The, the family did, and yeah. and. The story that I heard, although I'm not sure this is true, but the story that I heard was that when the more uh, religious relatives would come over, they would quickly stuff the Christmas tree under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But my, my dad was extremely proud of his Jewish heritage. Yeah. That, yeah. That, well, that's going to stink as a kid to have uh, your birthday on uh, Christmas. Uh, my, a friend of mine's birthday is on Halloween, which is just as bad as far as I'm concerned. Right. I know someone also born on Halloween. Oh uh, yeah, but but this is what you know. You you know so many people uh, whose parents were were famous, and you always hear these horror stories. Um, the thing that I got from 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 your book is your dad was great. Yeah. Your father, who was uh, a workaholic, um, as Homer Simpson would say addicted to workahol uh, but uh, but uh, he also uh you know th this isn't gary crosby oh you loved my father and he used to beat me with a pool cue this is like no your dad's actually a nicer guy than than you would even expect right right and i think people anticipate you know because he is this sort of foreboding presence in black and white mgm soundstage that he's going to be that person at home. And he was the polar opposite. I mean, I always say this, but my dad was brilliantly funny, tremendously silly, a practical joker. Um, again, the, the opposite of what one would expect. And if my friends were wary about meeting him for the first time, that dissipated within five minutes. Uh, yeah. And I, I, but I think a part of that is for people that do you know, the, for people whose work makes them, you know, has a, 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 you know, a heaviness to it. And, you know, like, that, well, then they can be light in their personal life because they've, they're, they're processing those things and they're, and they're getting them all out. The dark people are, you know, are the insurance adjusters that never really talk. And then, they, you know, and then they don't have an outlet for all of that stuff. But yeah, all of, you know, I'm a monster movie guy and all my friends are in, not all my friends, but um, many of my friends work in that business. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, no, we're we're the happiest people you know. Because mm-hmm. we we deal with all that stuff. You know, we we you know, all that all that stuff is is dealt with. One of the things that I, I think is is interesting that that you talk about in your book is many of the uh, Twilight Zone episodes that people that really stick to people that that, that really resonate were uh, a sort of autobiographical, like Walking Distance, which is one of my favorite episodes about the guy who goes back to literally walks into his hometown and sees himself as a child. Right. Uh, that your father, you, that was inspired by the fact that your dad would go back to his, uh, the house that he grew up in every, every year? Uh, yeah, every summer we came east to a cottage on my mother's side built by my great and great, great grandfathers. And Binghamton is about an hour away. And, and every summer... In upstate New York is where right. he was from, yeah. And, and every summer, my dad would take this annual pilgrimage and go back to his hometown and drive down the street and go see the merry-go-round and all his childhood haunts. So, yes, Walking Distance was definitely autobiographical, as was um, their tearing down to Morelli's Bar, the night gallery episode. Right, yeah, which is it, my favorite night gallery episode. Right, my, mine too, actually. And yeah. I, I always felt an equally beautiful script. Yeah, there are a couple of night galleries that really resonate. That uh, they're, they're all your, they're you know, there there are the ones that are great and scary that everybody remembers. Uh, yeah, the night gallery that I remember the most was Green Fingers, the one mm-hmm. with Elsa Lanchester, where mm-hmm. they kill her and she, bur- they bury her in the garden and she grows back. That was the one that I remember seeing as a child, because my mother would actually let me watch it. Uh, when I was too little to watch it, <laughs> and and uh, the the so I actually saw the Night Gallery before I saw Twilight Zone. Interesting. You know, I didn't get into yeah. Twilight Zone until I was in in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but as as you get older and 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 you know w- when you're six and seven years old, just the opening mm-hmm. of the Night Gallery is terrifying. That there's mm-hmm. that music was. Uh, to this day, it's like eh, they they did their job well in that regard. Yes, did. Yeah, yes, um, but then when you get older and you look at them from a, a bit of a more mature perspective, different different episodes step forward and, and resonate, and uh, and you can really see your 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 father's hand mm-hmm. uh, uh, in, in his episodes, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the ones that really stick are they're tearing down Tim Riley's bar, the Messiah on Mott Street. Is it Silent Snow, Secret Snow, I think is another really uh, amazing one. I'm not even sure if your father wrote it, but mm-hmm. uh, it was a great episode. Um, but I, 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 I want to re- go back to that, but I, but I want to stick with, with what we were speaking of before that, um, you know, for your, for your father, um, the, the work that resonates w- was very personal and you know they're walking distance and they're tearing down tim riley's bar are very similar stories thematically mm-hmm. about a man in, the, in both cases uh although it's not gender specific sort of not an un- unwillingness or, or an inability to let go of his past he, his yeah. past was always very much very much with him. A stop at Willoughby, the famous Twilight Zone episode, also has that, and that was very much uh, a part of your father. It seems that uh, he wasn't running away from his childhood or his past the way a lot of people do. Myself, yeah. but he really uh, uh, cherished it. It sounds. Yeah, like. He told a writing class actually that he had a propensity to to write about the past, and I think in part. And I'm thinking particularly of walking distance. You know, my dad enlisted in the war the day after he graduated from high school. He wanted to go to Germany because he wanted to fight the Nazis, but he was sent to the Philippines. He was in the paratrooper corps. Right, right. And he was too short to be a paratrooper. He got in just with grit and determination. Right, right. Yeah. But, you know, like like so many of these kids that go to war, they're, they're just so young. And that was actually one of the hardest parts of writing my book was reading the letters that his parents were writing him 
and that he was writing when he was still in training camp. Yeah. And then we should say that they're in the book, you know, it, 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 yeah, they're, yes. yeah, they're very, uh, it's very illuminating. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a, a bit of a revised edition and adding a little bit more with photographs and new commentary. But um, again, you know, reading these letters and uh, my son, had, uh, when I was writing some of those chapters was about that age that my dad was. So it really punctuated just how young these kids are. And so when my dad went away and went to war, you know, needless to say, everything changed in his life. And his father died at 52 when my dad was overseas. And even though the war wasn't over, my dad didn't have, or the war was over, but my, and my dad had enough points to come home. He, they wouldn't let him go. So he couldn't go to my father's funeral. So there was all that unresolved grief. And so I think, you know, in, in his writing, which, uh, was obviously quite cathartic. He went back to Binghamton in walking distance and saw his parents again. And his father's words to him, you know, you've been looking behind you, try looking ahead, I think was probably the message my dad wished that his father could say to him. What's interesting is that you say that your father used writing about the past to deal with his unresolved grief. And that is what you say in your book. And right. As I knew him, that right. you use the writing of that memoir mm-hmm. to deal with your unresolved grief because your father died. He was so young when he passed away. He was 50? 50. 50. 50. So young. And uh, you were 20? I just turned 20, like yeah. two years before that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, that was, and we knew, you know, obviously open heart surgery back then was not what it is today. But the idea of him not surviving was incomprehensible. Because he was larger than life. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I think I'm sure any any kid feels like that about their parent. Well, they can't die. Right. But it's um, right. It was I, I was paralyzed for years. Yeah, I can no. I can only I can only imagine. You know, my parents are eighty-seven and ninety, and mm-hmm. are still are still going. So yeah, I I, I can't uh, imagine it. And and for uh, a, a person who was so 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 full, I is mean, so full of life and so so engaged in the world. Uh, it, it had to have been uh, just just devastating. And then it must it must be strange to to live in that legacy. Everybody who, you know, myself included, everybody who meets you, who knows you, wants to talk about everybody who meets you, knowing who you are, wants to talk to you about your father. Well, you know, uh, and 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 to all and to at one point you talk about seeing him on TV and how interesting it was because you you look for him in the man on television also yeah, it, you, running across him when you're not expecting it must be right. jarring as well right well you know i i'm always when when people well he's one of my favorite subjects to talk about of course you know? yeah and, you know and i did write about this in the book that i didn't watch a lot of the twilight zones while my father was still alive um and it was only after that I really began to, and, and more to see him than the show. Of course. And then there was the episode in Praise of Pip that I watched, uh, where my dad used some of the dialogue that he and I used. Who's your best buddy? You are, Pops. And so it was, you know, literally I found him again in the Twilight Zone. So right. And, and Pops was his nickname for you. Yes. <laughs> yes we uh, we uh, the everyone in our family had nicknames including the dogs <laughs> That's so yeah mine are mine are idiot one and idiot <laughs> <laughs> i have one dog that's really smart and i have another dog that may be the dumbest living <laughs> organism <laughs> Well, one of my nicknames was Grumple, and he wrote me a letter once and wrote accent on Grump because I was <laughs> making too many long distance phone calls to my friends, and he was pissed off about it. So, <laughs> and you, and you all, you know, you also, I'm, I'm uh, so, and you know, I'm envious of you 
growing up where you did, when you did. I mean, you were also a teenager in L.A. in the late 60s, um, which had to have been just I romanticize it because I was too young to be there. And, uh, you know, in 1968, I was four. I didn't really get involved <laughs> in the world that much. But like to be here at the cultural epicenter of uh, of all that stuff must. I mean, I just imagine the concerts that you saw. I mean, <laughs> I mean, did you did you go like were you one of those kids? Walking down Sunset Strip in 1970. Actually, no, not at all. I hate to disappoint oh, okay. you. No, that's fine. Well, it's, 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 it's the the it's the truth. So yeah, I'm very curious. Is like so you weren't around for Riot on the Sunset Strip or any of that no, stuff. I, I do remember marching in the um, against the Vietnam War, but I was so young that I wasn't really cognizant of what right. the you know what the significance of all that was. But right. Um, certainly, you know, my dad was very involved and, um, and, and although I circling back, I preface this with, you know, he was just so funny and, um, silly. There was of course a very serious side to him. And, you know, we were always very aware that particularly, uh, prejudice, in fact, he said is the greatest evil of our time. Right. And, and he wrote um, about it uh, uh, extensively. Right. He said it's a theme in almost everything that he wrote. So, and, yeah. and you know, and the war, too. In fact, um, he would probably not have become a writer if not, if not for the war. And um, he was going to major in phys ed when he went to Antioch on the GI Bill because he liked working with kids. Uh-huh. Right. He was just so traumatized. And, of course... There wasn't post traumatic any awareness really of post traumatic stress disorder then. It no. was called what shell shock. Shell shock, yeah. Right. So he just and and you know, these vets had nowhere to to process this, I guess is the word. Yeah. So they still don't. <laughs> yeah. And it's in our beautiful system, they still it. don't. Right. Well, right. How can they? I mean, how can you witness that and and be sane? Right? Right. Yeah. You said uh, that uh, in addition to having a, a physical wound from the war, which I didn't know, mm-hmm. that he had a, a, a knee injury, was it? Right. Um, he was hit with shrapnel in the wrist and the knee, and his knee would go out frequently when he was walking down the stairs and he would collapse. Yeah, so there was that constant physical reminder, too. Right? So so in, in, in modern day, he would have had a knee replacement, I guess so, you know, and it would spontaneously bleed, too. Um, it was very strange. Really? But, uh, yeah, obviously quite a um, pronounced injury. Yeah, and and he was in uh, probably in physical pain more than he let on. Yeah. Uh, and psychically that you said that he would scream at night sometimes in his sleep. Yeah, He'd have yeah, nightmares. Um, and I would ask him in the morning what was wrong, and he would tell me he was having nightmares that the enemy was coming at him. Right. So, yeah, yeah. It's, um, well, that's well, again, that, you know, yeah, the greatest generation, as they say. That, right. And again, you know, when I read these letters that he wrote right before being launched into the war, he was a kid. He was writing letters like he was at summer camp. Um, mm-hmm. Send me C's candy. Can you send me a new wallet? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, and, I, and that's what was so heart wrenching to then know what would follow. Yeah. And again, and, he's not unique to that, but no. yeah. And, and nor, nor did he ever make, nor did he ever make that claim right. Uh, right. for some of the brighter things though. What, what is uh, very interesting is I, I think because of that, he was also really able to experience and live your childhood. You know, that that's the thing is that you, he was all in as a dad. And one of my, the sweetest stories is that he took you to Disneyland every year on your birthday. On my birthday. Yeah. Yeah. We would have a content and, you know, and I recognize how fortunate I was to be able to do that. Um, But we would have a That's great that you do because I do that with my kids and they take it for granted. They're awful. (laughs) (laughs) But we would have a contest. Whoever saw the first sign got to pick the first ride. Oh, that's funny. I imagine what Disneyland must have been like back then in like 65, 66. Yeah. It's just the bullseye of when people reminisce about like the peak of like Americana. 
and before things got so awful. I always think of like 1966, Southern California must have been just great. Mm-hmm. Uh, in addition to being very, uh, uh, a lot of stuff below the, a lot of stuff below the surface that wasn't so great. He was not as uh, involved with Night Gallery as Twilight Zone. I think people don't understand. People don't understand that uh, that uh, Twilight Zone really was uh, his, right. and then Night Gallery started out as his, but he didn't want the day to day production headaches. Well, and the major issue was that he didn't have creative control as right. he did with the Twilight Zone, and um, he was not so inclined to want you know the horror of it. Yeah. And there was a lot of controversy with that. But yeah. I, I will say again that I think some of his best writing was um, in, in a couple of the scripts of Night Gallery. Tim Riley's Bar was nominated for, for an Emmy. Yeah, and uh, The Messiah on Ma Street, which is one of the, you know, for for a guy who grew up Jewish, he wrote some really classic Christmas episodes. And also uh, um, one of my favorite Twilight Zones, Night of the Meek, with yeah. Art Carney yeah. as a, 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 just a department store Santa who finds a bag of garbage that yeah. becomes Santa's bag. Right. Um, right. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's interesting, too, in that I never put this together. Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol largely from the same motivation that your dad would have. It. He, he visited... Um, the I think it was called a ragged house at the time, uh, where they would clothe, feed, and educate London street kids. And he was so horrified at their treatment. And uh he was uh and and the callousness that the adults had for the children, that that's what moved him to write a Christmas Carol. And you know, the Christmas Carol is all Christmas Carol is a very you know, I'm doing it backwards. It's a very Rod Serling-y story. It's a, you know, it's a, um, it's a morality tale about somebody who comes out on the, on the positive, which was, I think, one of the reasons of the Twilight Zone. It's one of the reasons that I love the Twilight Zone and I don't love Black Mirror, which I don't know if you've ever seen it. Mm-hmm. But the, the, at the end of the day, the Twilight Zone was optimistic that that people learned, people grew, and that bad people were punished. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have the undiluted nihilism that Black Mirror has. And I know it's great. Mm -hmm. It's personal taste. Um, That at the end of the day, and that speaks to your dad, that he was was still hopeful. I've not Uh, seen Black Mirror. I have heard good things about it, though. It's really brilliant, but it wouldn't... I find Black... Again, I know it's brilliant, but... uh, And there are some... There are some episodes that have a, a, a Twilight Tony twist that's to the positive, but there's a lot of just uh, uh, nihilism. And uh, uh, and it's really about... Uh, too. Ma- I find too many of the episodes to be about the futility of hope. Mm-hmm. And uh, But, you know, Lord knows there's certainly a good enough reason for it. Uh, one of the, one of the stories that your, uh, your dad wrote, he's doing the Twilight Zone. And you don't, you couldn't have seen him that much because I've run a TV show and you can't be home. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, you know, you're, you're never home when you're doing it. Um, and he did it, you know, hardcore for five years, was it? Right, Four right. Yeah. He, he did have an, he, his office originally was in the downstairs of the house. And then he built an office in the backyard. I know he, you know, when he did the Mike Wallace interview that a lot of people talk about, um, he mentions that he worked 12 hour days, but I never, and I wrote this, I never had the sense that my dad wasn't available. You know, we Uh knew that when he was out writing, we weren't supposed to bother him, but. If you're not in life, what are you going to write about? Right. But then my dad would drive over to the studio and they'd make any necessary changes. And apparently my father, I've heard, was very adaptable to that and and really listened to what the actors felt and, and mm-hmm. the director. And Because he was talented. And a nice and guy. He, and, and he then, was talented uh, and he was a nice guy and he knew he was good. Right. 
and, and so you accepted. you're not afraid of you're not afraid of input right. you know that you're you're secure enough to know that it's that it's a it's a script is a living document right. and and that uh it ebbs and flows and you need that security to yeah know you need that. to know that you know, it's like yeah fine make it better that's fine mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm and, sure he would draw the line, you know, if he felt quite strongly that no, this really yeah, or change for no reason. There's there's change that make things better, and there are changes that make things different. It's like no, I know you've heard it three times. You've heard it three times. It's it's old to you. It's not old to the audience. They haven't heard it yet. It's good the way it is. Yeah, but uh, you could just I think you could tell that he was he was just. He was gifted and brilliant and secure enough in his work that he would that he would leave it open. Yeah, he. I've never heard. Uh, I've never heard a. You've never. I've never heard a story about your father that wasn't what a great guy he was. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know that was one of the reasons I I wrote the book because he had been described as this dark and tortured person, and again, that's not who we knew. That's not who his friends knew. Uh, one of the writers quoted uh, someone falsely. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I had talked to some friends, and they hadn't said what this writer uh, eventually wrote. So I thought, well, here's an opportunity to set the record straight for anyone that cares. So yeah, and it's great, and, and you know, in 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 uh, the it, it, it's a very uplifting book to read in in this uh, in this day and age too, where where, you know, being an asshole is so celebrated uh, that uh, that it's it's not mandatory that you can actually be a decent human being. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. particularly, yeah, we're really seeing that, aren't we? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, uh, I can only imagine because knowing knowing how uh, your father felt about President Nixon, I can't imagine how he would have handled. Uh, well. I, I can tell you what I think. Um, yeah, I'd love to know. I, I, can, I, I have a good guess. <laughs> but yeah, he would be, and, and I've said this, he would be initially deep, deeply saddened by what's going on in the world or, or, and then apoplectic about, we won't say his name, but... Yeah, I yeah, can only... Apoplectic, apoplectic. <clears throat> you might not, didn't he write, an article about the danger of no, without naming the name about when Reagan was going to run for governor about how dangerous it was to have a professional actor in politics. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not familiar with that specifically, but I know how he felt. I, I, I'm not remembering. And there's the famous Twilight. I mean, there it's written about it. There are Twilight Zones about uh, about mm-hmm. it. He uh, wasn't a big John Wayne fan either, by the way. I don't know. Oh, Maybe. oh, really? Yeah. Well, no, I can understand. I know why, <laughs> you know, and also especially because, and I, I don't know, you know, your father, uh, you know, your father was an anti-war advocate who fought mm-hmm. in a war, and John mm-hmm. Wayne was a pro-war advocate who never did. Well, what what I uh, recall my dad saying was the biggest danger that John Wayne ever really experienced was a flying starlet. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I butchered that, but it's sure. Just, but I, get, I take your point. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, that's a that, and that's a well deserved. Uh, that's a well deserved critique. I also didn't know, and it certainly makes sense. He hated Hogan's Heroes. Yeah, because he didn't think you know where's the comedy in in concentration camps and Nazi Germany and and, uh, and that that's the amazing thing because. If you look at Hogan's Heroes now, it's horrifying. Mm-hmm. At the time, most people just thought it was funny. And at the time, most of the people that were working on the show had experienced the Nazis mm-hmm. firsthand. Now we're generations away from it. And it's more horrifying than at the time. And I don't know if that's a weird thing that they were so close to it they couldn't see it or they... Or they need, or this helped them distance it. You know, there's all sorts of things. You know, that you see stuff on TV from five years ago that you couldn't do today. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but 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 Hogan's Heroes is insane. <laughs> I mean, it's really insane. And at the time, your father is one of the only people I know, uh, you know, that I've read of that that said in the moment at the time, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> you know, most people are like, eh, "It's fine. They're funny. It's Clank. He's funny." <laughs> And that, uh, and that he loved the, that he hated Hogan's Heroes, and he loved the Flintstones. Yeah, yeah. We would. I was not allowed. Our my mother's rule: we couldn't watch TV during the week. So my dad and I, I would sneak in and watch it with my dad. Yeah. Oh, that is so. That is so. Funny. <laughs> he loved it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the. I didn't know the Flintstones was on that. When did it premiere? I didn't know it was on that I, early. I have no yeah. idea. Remember sneaking in to watch it with him. Oh, that's funny. So then he, and I, I do want to ask you, like, how it colored your parenting with your children. Mm-hmm. I know in my case, I aspire to be to my children what your father was to you guys because my father was the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so he was a reverse barometer. Mm-hmm. Uh, every, I do everything that he didn't do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and um, uh, I'm you know when when you became a parent, uh, do do you ever, you know how how does your childhood color you as a parent? I'm curious. Well, I I probably parent more like I was parented by my dad than my mother. My mother was sort of the one that was in charge of disciplining, and not my dad. So, uh, yeah, again, I'm the easier parent, which is not always necessarily a good thing. No, it's not. um, You know, I I read, uh, there's a writer, Roger Rosenblatt, who, um, and I may be saying his name wrong, but he wrote a graduation speech for his daughter about what he wished for her. I think it was from high school. And he wished her, you know, her continued love of books and um, traveling and all this. And then he said, and this really hit home, he said, And I wished her moments of helpless hilarity. And I thought, when I think about my dad, it is those moments of helpless hilarity. And and that's, I think, a gift that um, my dad gave me and I would love to pass on to hopefully my kids, you know, and I hope I have. Yeah, he was he was very good friends with Carol Burnett. Yeah. It's yeah, just, who, who is just so lovely. You know, she she wrote yeah. me a blurb and, and has stayed in touch. And, and you know, other people have said this too. She's the opposite of what you would expect from someone who who is that famous. She's exactly. um, just the kindest woman. Yeah, there's a, there's, um, it's funny when you meet people that are very successful to see, you know, and, and pardon my language, you know, assholes are born. They're not made. And it, it's funny who's kind because you can never tell. You never know. And I've seen, you know, I've been around, I've been in the business for a long time. I've seen people being impossibly rude. Mm-hmm. And and then you, I, I'll never forget I was at a function and someone introduced me to Don Rickles. And they said, uh, uh, Don, this is a, a friend of mine who's also a comedian, Dana Gould. And I said, uh, how are you, Mr. Rickles? And he goes, what's your name again? I go, Dana Gould. He goes, I don't care. Mm-hmm. And then he grabbed my arm and he goes, see, that's my thing. I, I make fun of people. Uh, you have to have a thing. You need like a shtick. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, no, no. I have a sh-. And he was he was very sweet. He was very helpful. He was like, so you're good with your money? Are you smart with your money? <laughs> like he was he was like my he was like like his like this uncle that you was, he was just like, what did yeah. it take a moment to make him lunch? You know, he couldn't he couldn't have been he couldn't have been nicer. Uh uh, oh, that's was, good. I wasn't sure yeah. where you're scared. Yeah, no, like I was, exp- you were, you were yeah. like at first I thought he was going to attack me and then he, he couldn't, he couldn't have been, uh, he couldn't have been kinder. Um, and then people, uh, Charlton Heston, with whom I did not agree politically, could not have been nicer. Really? Yeah, yeah could yeah. not have been nicer. Um, so, you know, you know, I think people like that are, people like that are born. I mean, you're, mm-hmm. they're born, not made. Um mm-hmm. Don, Don Rickles saw my dad and um, Don Rickles was doing one of his shticks and um, he knew my dad was there and he said, stand up, Rod. And then he said, oh, you are standing. 
<laughs> yeah, he. Your father was short. He was like what five five. Five, four and three quarters. Five, four and three quarters. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and amazing that he got into the, he got into the paratroopers. Yeah. Well, your father wasn't sure that the show was going to get renewed. He thought it was going to get canceled. I think this was Mm -hmm. the fourth season. Mm -hmm. And so he took a teaching job in Ohio, which is a strange thing for a guy running a television series to do in his off season. Uh, and so he thinks, well, this will be good. I'll just, I'll go to Ohio and I'll teach and I'll recharge my batteries. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of take a, almost like a year abroad. I'm going to really unplug and recharge my batteries. And he ends up working harder that year than any other year. <laughs> Yeah, he, he, we went to Yellow Springs, um, and he'd gone to Antioch there. So, you know, it was familiar. And so I think there was probably a little bit of the nostalgic tie to going back there, too. But, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the relaxing year because uh, uh, we were there for six months, and he had to fly back and forth. Because the show but, ended up, the show did get picked up. Right. And so, so I think, Yeah. Yeah. And then he also, that was the year that, that was 63 and Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And in addition to flying back and forth between Ohio and Los Angeles for the Twilight Zone, he was also flown to Washington by the government to write a short film for the Johnsons. For Johnson, right. And while while he was in the hotel writing this, he could see... uh, Kennedy's funeral going down the street. So yeah, it was um, a traumatizing, sad, sad time. Yeah, I can, and I, I, I can only imagine what, uh, and, and to be at the time he was so famous that he was the guy the government called to come and do this thing. He was a writer and a celebrity, which is. Your audio oh, just went out. Oh, I was just saying it's he's that rarity of rarities. He was a writer who was a celebrity. I mean, even Stephen King, I bet, can pretty much walk down the street and maybe one in every 20 people recognize him. Well, you know, he, my dad was actually not the person who was going to do the on-camera opening monologue and closing monologue. They wanted... Um, I know the name Orson is really... Orson Welles, I think it was. Yeah, they wanted Orson see. Welles and then some other guy that has a really strange right. name, like... right. Yeah. Um, but I guess Orson Welles wanted too much money. And my dad, you know, it, when he was at Antioch, he worked in radio, so he would direct and act in these. So, you know, right. some of the, some of the that was kind of natural to him. And he was a ham. So, but, sure. you know, the, the rec- he was recognized. So, yeah. Well, he, and yeah. I mean, he happened to be great at it. You know, it was mm-hmm. it was the fit the role. But but what I mean is like he. Like, I'm sure when you guys would go to Disneyland, people stopped him every two feet. Yeah. And, you know, my dad was always so gracious about that. You yeah. Know, where, where you think it would, I mean, I think it irritated us more than it sure. did, did my father. But he was just so grateful that, you know, people appreciated and wanted to talk for the most part. I'm sure there were moments when he wanted to disappear and not be seen. But yeah. And yeah, I also think in those days the paparazzi uh, were nothing like they are today. Sure, so. and and I also think that having gone through what he went through in the war, that you have a different bar in terms of things that bother you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like, you know that, yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought of it that yeah. way. Yeah, you know? it's like yeah, I was on starvation rations, living in the mud for a month. Mm. Uh, I don't mind signing an autograph in line at the monorail. (laughs) You know, know, a lot of time, you know, you're running a TV show and you're, you're busy 20 hours a day and then it stops and it can be very disconcerting uh, because suddenly your schedule is, you know, is open. Did, did he, it seemed to me that he, did he see the show getting canceled? It must have been a a, a quiet relief. In, in I'm a way. sure. You know, I, I I'm sure. You were very young at that point. That it was. Yeah, I was yeah. quite young. But um, 
Yeah. And I think, you know, he said, you know, in interviews for the most part, he was really proud of the show. Mm -hmm. He said they had some turkeys, but, you know, also the other writers, um, uh, the wife of the old producer. I mean, and these were just, you know, fabulous writers, you know, Matheson, yeah, Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont, Charles Beaumont, Earl um, Hamner. Earl Hamner. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, uh George I'm sure there was Johnson, just, yeah. yeah, George Clayton Johnson. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure there was the sadness of things ending, but um, I think there was a relief too. Cause my, and my dad had wanted to write a Broadway play and he wanted to write a novel. So, you know, he was looking forward to all these things. Did he ever do either? Uh, well, you know, the, he wrote three novellas and, and a couple of right. those are what yeah, and, and a lot of collections, which like and werewolves and werewolves. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, they became and um, Requiem for Heavyweight actually did become a Broadway show after, or Broadway, uh, yeah, show after he died. Mm -hmm. uh, John Lithgow was in it. Um, right, I believe, I believe a friend of mine was in it too. I believe John McGinley might have been in that okay, production. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, there was a lot more that he was looking forward to doing. Yeah, and his brother wrote a his brother wrote a popular right. novel. The his president's wrote, plane is missing. Right, right, yeah. and that's his brother Robert. Right, right. Um, Quite a bit older than my dad. He was seven years older than my father. Right. One of one of the interesting things in the night uh, the night gallery. There's a night gallery Christmas episode that doesn't you know that get that doesn't get a lot of heat because most people think of Art Carney's. Uh, Night of the Meat, right. but 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 this was 1971 or two, and it stars Edward G. Robinson and Yafet Koto, mm -hmm. and and Yafet Koto basically plays God in it. If I'm not, mm -hmm. that was also for the time a pretty daring move on your dad's part. The Messiah on Mott Street, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and that's know, a night also, gallery. That's not a Twilight Zone, yeah. right? Also deals with his love of Christmas and justice and yeah and and the magic of uh, the relationship between an adult and a, and a child yeah the, the thing that i wanted to to, to close on uh, because this is the christmas episode of the show and if you are looking for christmas gifts you could do no worse than as i knew him my dad rod serling by ann serling and also pick up a copy of rod serling's night gallery the art of darkness an easy title to think of and find online right. um, there it is <laughs> Not to be confused with The Heart of Darkness, but you can also <laughs> buy that book, too. It's still very good. <laughs> After The Twilight Zone ended, he was commissioned by the United Nations to write a TV special called A Carol for Another Christmas. Mm -hmm. And that, what's interesting is it's Sterling Hayden and Peter Sellers, the same year Dr. Strangelove came out, or the year after. It's very serious. It's basically a retelling of Scrooge but in terms of in terms of being um he's not stingy he's an isolationist and the point of the story was to sell the concept of the you know to reaffirm the concept of the united nations to people right. which is which, which had been under attack under attack right because people were saying that you know the whole point of the united nations was you know countries working together to avoid going to war uh and a lot of people viewed it as a, a global government that would s uh, surpass the autonomy of the united states people still have this issue um and the and and your father came under came under attack because people said that he was helping the communist conspiracy by writing this special but anyway, yeah, there was a lot of mail after that show came out, you know, that my dad was just trying to promote communism. And um, yeah, and he, he answered that, a lot of it. Yeah, oh, he did. But he said, actually, you know, his message was that, as, and I, I'm going to butcher this, but that, you know, we have a responsibility to care about each other. And Yeah, and that's not a bad thing. No, it sure isn't. And. I don't know how that got lost. You know, there's, there's so much, you know, the, the whole concept of America about being a, a rugged, about individualism and individual freedom is great. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to come at the expense of other people, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, when that got, you know, I, I don't know when that became codified. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's, you know, I wish your dad was, I wish your dad could have written about it.
before before I let you go, um, are you uh, did you you found writing this book very um, cathartic, and you've written a forward in uh, the Night Gallery? Are you are you uh, writing something else, or are you? Uh, well, I, I've been working on a novel for I think now two hundred years. Yes, um, sure. <laughs> and, and to quote to quote my dad about one of the last things he was writing, it's beginning to. Uh, Destroy me piecemeal. It's it's a whole different animal writing a novel, but I'm sticking. Yes, with it. it is. I'm in. I'm. A, 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 I'm. I don't know how you wrote this. Like I, I like you know like I. Everybody, so many people have, so many people have this book in them, mm-hmm. or so they think, and then to actually see it is like, oh no, this is too much work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it really wasn't because it, it it's it's cliche, but it truly was a labor of love. And it's a book yeah. that took a lot of years. I had started I another imagine, one yeah. called um, In In His Absence, but I had not even begun to deal with the grief, so I couldn't finish that. But That's I knew where I was going with this book. I knew the story, you know, obviously. A yeah. novel is so different, you know, it's that constant creating characters and, and you know, it's it's just it's, oh yeah I I can imagine and you um and your your mother passed not long ago yes in January in January I'm sorry I'm sorry for that it it it, it was also interesting for me to read this because as I said like uh you know my dad's ninety my mom's eighty seven my mom is in a nursing home she's not well um it, it's uh, yeah it's okay uh but it, but it's like it's like I know you know it's the it's the top of the ninth. <laughs> you know you know the you know this uh it, it you know uh, people are heading for the exits and uh so it's 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 an odd it's an odd feeling and what what you know you think that you're as people say you think that you're ready and then you're it happens and you're not yeah. and i can only imagine at 50 from a that, what a bizarre you know that that it's jarring yeah, yeah. Although, you know, I, I'm so lucky to have had him, as, you know, for 20 years. So, yeah. And, and, I don't forget that. and such a great dad. In terms of uh, quality, not quantity, you certainly came out ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, to have people still talking about my dad and, and like Taylor writing this. In know, a good way. <laughs> uh, my, no one would be more surprised than my father that, you know, he's still remembered and still being talked about. And, and it's, so interesting that that when people tell me like a lot of people have told me that they had tumultuous childhoods and think of my dad as their dad so, uh-huh. or or became writers because of my father and and he would just be so humbled and and um I'm one of those people well yeah it's really true it, it's really true the the books are as I knew him uh my dad Rod Serling and also uh Rod Serling's night gallery the art of darkness uh both uh and Serling and with an e thank you thanks so very much yeah, thank uh, you so much it's been a pleasure talking to you and meeting your family and <laughs> yeah, thank you most of Well, here it is, Christmas Eve, and it's a nice feeling. The children are in bed and the tree is all trimmed. I'm proud this year of the present I got from my wife, Peggy. I sat down and wrote out a tag to Peggy. But this is the time to write down some of the little things I think of so often, things I can never seem to say out loud. To Peggy, for marrying me in the first place. And for your making ours such a happy family. They say bringing up two children is hard work, but you always manage to make it seem like play, like the endless brushing, brushing, brushing of Janie's hair. You gave me a wonderful family that I can never even think of without a feeling of pride for bringing up our children single-handed while I mostly sat back and gave advice. For the 2008 socks you darned, And there's something else that's strictly your department. For how do you always manage to look like a million dollars on the money I give you? It always seems that when we're in a hurry, I can never remember where I put things, and I'm always blaming you for misplacing them. There's something about the way you change from the lady of the manor to chief cook and bottle washer that continues to amaze me for planning a thousand meals a year and having me take them for granted. For 
being the family chauffeur years on end in all kinds of weather, for never letting Janie or Bill know fear, no matter how frightened you were yourself. For never letting Jane or Bill know fear, no matter how frightened you were yourself. For wanting a good watch for ever so long, and letting your slow-moving husband think he'd hit on it all by himself. Just for being you, darling. Here's your Hamilton. No gift means more than a Hamilton watch. Someone you love is hoping for a Hamilton this Christmas. I'm going to send you a happy new year. In the 19th century, London became the world's largest city. It was capital of the British Empire, which stood astride the globe. It was also a city of massive, shocking poverty, with thousands of people living in squalor, forced into dark, overcrowded slums. Just ask Jack the Ripper. The children of the London slums were a great concern to Buckingham Palace. Many were basically feral. And as such, they were not allowed into Sunday school. And a generation of wild-eyed maniacs with no frame of societal or religious reference was deemed a potential danger to the crown, because it was. And so we saw the birth of the Ragged Schools. Ragged Schools were an attempt to provide food, clothing, and a fundamental education and religious instruction to London street children. Now, in the mid-1800s, The British writer Charles Dickens, who by that time had written the Pickwick Papers and Oliver Twist, visited one of these schools and was horrified by the poverty, the struggle, and the insurmountable chasm of economic inequality. Sound familiar? So shocked, he was moved to write about it. He put quill to paper and wrote, A Christmas Carol, in prose, being a ghost story of Christmas. The full title. A Christmas Carol was written at a time of growing awareness of London's economic stratification and a reevaluation of Christmas traditions. For example, Christmas trees were just coming into vogue, as was the tradition of caroling. A Christmas Carol was published in 1843 and became an instant classic, a morality tale in which a wealthy and selfish man named Ebenezer Scrooge learns the errors of his ways after being visited by three ghosts, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. The novella was put on stage almost immediately. By February, there were eight different productions playing in London. Dickens would go on to write other Christmas stories. The following year, he wrote The Chimes. The year after that, The Cricket on the Heath. Then The Battle of Life in 1846, but none of them would be nearly as successful as A Christmas Carol. Now, over the course of time, the story has acted as a a cultural mirror. For example, uh, the film version during the Great Depression shows Bob Cratchit as a struggling everyman fighting for dignity against the evil banks. But in the 60s, Scrooge was a Freudian figure working through the wreckage of his own childhood. IMDb lists around 200 filmed versions of A Christmas Carol, including Disney's A Christmas Carol and Mickey's Christmas Carol, which are two different productions. We have Nashville's Christmas Carol, A Christmas Carol and Zombies, of course, Snore, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, Barbie's Christmas Carol, Smurf's Christmas Carol, The Flintstones' Christmas Carol, Teabag's Christmas Carol, Dollywood's Christmas Carol, and on and on and on. How has Tyler Perry not made Medea's Christmas Carol? Or have I missed that? But one of the most interesting versions of A Christmas Carol is a stark, black-and-white, anti-war parable released in 1964, starring Sterling Hayden and Peter Sellers. Now, I know what you're saying. No, that's Dr. Strangelove. No, there was another stark, black-and-white, anti-war parable starring Sterling Hayden and Peter Sellers that came out in 1964 directed by none other than Joseph Mankiewicz, brother of Herman Mankiewicz, who is the subject of the movie Mank, who wrote Citizen Kane. 
And Joseph Mankiewicz himself was a, a legendary writer and director. He made All About Eve, Guys and Dolls, Cleopatra. The film was written by Rod Serling. So you may be wondering, Joseph Mankiewicz, Rod Serling, Sterling Hayden, Peter Sellers, why haven't I heard of the goddamn thing? It was 1963, and the United Nations was approaching its 25th anniversary. But it's having a very hard time. It's coming under constant attack from right-wingers, people like the John Birch Society, who were accusing the UN of being a front for the worldwide communist conspiracy and fomenting a one-world government that would supplant the sovereignty of the United States of Merkel. Now, the UN had a thing called the Special Fund, which was basically a big bag of money. The Special Fund was managed by a guy named Paul Hoffman, and he approached a PR guy named Edgar Rosenberg, Fun fact, if you ever heard Joan Rivers mention my husband Edgar, that's Edgar Rosenberg. And his story is actually really tragic, but put a pin in that. One weird story at a time. Rosenberg was enlisted to help the UN reinforce its original brand as an international peacekeeping organization and short-circuit the attempted rebranding of the UN as a stalking horse for the world communist conspiracy. Rosenberg hatched the idea of a series of televised dramas that would feature, for lack of a better term, stories that thematically reinforced the UN's values. For the first of these, they went to Rod Serling. The film was set to air on December 28, 1964. And in keeping with the season, Serling pitched the idea of A Carol for Another Christmas. In Serling's story, the Scrooge character is a wealthy American industrialist named Benjamin Grudge. Now, his name was changed to Daniel Grudge because Benjamin Grudge's initials, B.G., match those of the odds-on Republican presidential favorite candidate that year, Barry Goldwater. So it was Daniel Grudge. And unlike Scrooge, Grudge's crime is in greed, it's isolationism, or America first, as it's now called. Grudge's son, Marley, was killed in the Philippines during World War II, like Rod Serling in real life almost was. And Grudge's grief has turned him inward. We meet Grudge on Christmas Eve, alone in his mansion, mournfully looking at his deceased son's war medals. And he gets a visitor. No, it's not a ghost. It's his nephew, Fred, played by a spunky young Ben Gazzara, who's visiting with a complaint Grudge is a wealthy and powerful man, and he makes big financial contributions to the university that Fred attends. And Fred was strongly behind a cultural exchange program that the university was about to embark on. A professor from the university was going to go to Krakow, Poland, then communist, and a professor from then communist Krakow, Poland was going to come to the university. Not so fast, says Grudge. That's what's known these days as a cultural exchange. You know, Fred, for a fairly talented professor of history, you seem to be a little naive as to the current political climate of the native country of this professor, whatever his name is. So he pulls the plug, which sends Fred to his house. Their argument is not subtle. Grudge thinks the U.S. should stay out of international affairs, stop participating in cultural exchange programs, cut foreign aid to the needy, and pull out of discussions at the United Nations. Fred disagrees. He thinks the U.S. should help all people in need and engage fully with the U.N. to avoid future wars and nuclear destruction. It seems Uncle Daniel and Nephew Fred are on opposite sides of every issue, except one, of course. They both love Daniel's son, Marley. It is then that Grudge is visited by the first ghost, the ghost of Christmas past, played by Steve Lawrence. That's right, Steve Lawrence, if you don't know who that is. He went on to great fame in the 60s and 70s as part of Steve and Edie, the singing duo he formed with his wife, Edie Gourmet. But here he is the ghost of Christmas past, and he takes Grudge back to his time in the Army, just after World War II, where he visited a field hospital that was working with Japanese children whose faces had been destroyed by radiation from the atomic bomb dropped on them by the United States. Grudge cites the waste and devastation as an example of why the U.S. should just tuck its head down and stay home. But the ghost makes the point that when the talking stops, the bullets and the bombs start. 
The Ghost of Christmas Present is played by Pat Hingle, who was Commissioner Gordon in the Michael Keaton Batman movies. Most perplexing, however, is The Ghost of Christmas Future, played by Quint himself, Robert Shaw. Now, this is also interesting in that the actor playing Grudge, Sterling Hayden, was Spielberg's first choice for Quint. But instead of making a movie on a boat, Hayden said he'd rather go fishing himself. And he did just that. Sterling Hayden, if you don't know about that guy, check him out. He is the real deal. The spirit takes Grudge to his own local town hall, which is now in shambles. The town, you see, has been destroyed in the future by a nuclear blast. And slowly the local townspeople begin filing in, waiting for the arrival of their charismatic leader, Donald Trump. No, this is a movie played by none other than Peter Sellers. It was Sellers' first work since suffering a near-fatal heart attack earlier that year. Sellers appears in a pilgrim outfit or a Santa outfit, it's black and white and I can't tell, and a cowboy hat. And he appears to preach about the United States' new form of government, individualism and self-reliance taken to a cartoonish extreme, also known as modern-day Michigan. So self-absorbed are these survivors that their leader refers to himself, on their behalf, as the Imperial Me. Because, because we have now reached a pure state of civilization. The world of the ultimate me is finally within our grasp. It's a world where only the strong will exist, where only the powerful. Where finally, the word we will be stamped out and will become I forever. Because we are each the wise. We are each the strong. And we are each the individual me's. Subtle it is not, but it's also pretty goddamn prescient. Grudge's butler, Charles, shows up and tries to talk some sense into the mob and is literally chased up into the rafters. Once there, the crowd begins chanting, Jump! 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 And when Grudge is moved to come to his rescue, the mob turns on him. He flees and is shot by a kid in a cowboy suit. This thing is crazy. As you may have guessed, A Carol for Another Christmas is dark. Grudge is killed, but wakes up in his home on Christmas Day to learn that maybe, just maybe, it's not too late to change. Or is it? Rod Serling was in a sour mood in 1964. The assassination of President Kennedy, followed by America's rapidly increasing involvement in Vietnam, affected him deeply. Despite the parade of A-list talent involved in the production, both in front of and behind the camera, A Carol for Another Christmas was shown once and shelved. AMC showed it recently, a couple years ago. Well, the word you find a lot in reviews is didactic. It's more than a little preachy, uh, even if I do agree with the lesson. Additionally, it premiered on December 28th, which is three days after Christmas, when, you know, people have moved on. After it aired, the network, ABC, and the sponsor, Xerox, were buried in letters accusing them of helping further the great communist conspiracy. Serling was miffed at people's glaring and he thought willful misunderstanding of the piece. He actually wrote people back. In one reply, he wrote, It was not my intention to aid and conspire when I wrote the TV script Carol for Another Christmas, nor was I remotely interested in propagandizing for the United Nations or any organization. I was deeply interested in conveying what is a deeply held conviction of my own. This is simply to suggest that human beings must involve themselves in the anguish of other human beings. This, I submit to you, is not a political thesis at all. It is simply an expression of what I hope might ultimately be seen as humanity for humanity's sake. If you want to learn more about Carol for Another Christmas, it is not available for streaming that I could find, but the website Den of Geek, which is a great website if you don't go to it, they just did a pretty lengthy article on it themselves that I saw after I started this one, so I tried to cover different aspects of it. So check out Den of Geek. Definitely worth a look. 
for your Rod Serling Christmas hit, might I also suggest the Twilight Zone episode Night of the Meek and the Night Gallery episode The Messiah on Mott Street. Why are they so great? Hmm. They're, uh, they're, uh... One part the wondrous spirit of Christmas and one part the magic that can only be found in the Twilight Zone. Christmas Eve. Our tree is trimmed and all the presents are wrapped. I have only one more job. The note I want to write to go with Jim's present. But I want to tell him, in words that won't embarrass him, why I think he's a pretty wonderful husband. Well, Jim always says the only way to get a thing done is to start doing it. So, to Jim, for holding my hand tight the day we were married. And for never letting go. Even during the years when every woman begins to think she's losing her glamour. No day at all. For making me feel I am still your best girl, even though we've been married a long, long time. For all the things you didn't say the time I ripped the fender off the car. And then those early mornings for sparing me those chilly trips to heat the 6 a.m. bottle. And at 6 p.m., times you came home with a sirloin steak appetite only to be faced with something straight out of a can for being a good sport and seldom remarking that's what I had for lunch and after dinner when we have company and you've been cornered by a couple of the girls (laughs) I'm sure there are 40 other places you'd rather be for treating my women friends as though you really like them. And for the way your eyes light up when our glances happen to meet at a party. But it wasn't always a party. I remember the hospital when I was a little scared and feeling sorry for myself. You may come in now, sir. And in you came with a laugh. It was just what the doctor ordered. I ordered the kiss on my own for being so eternally there for me to lean on. For being so eternally there for me to lean on. For wanting a good watch for years and years, but being too unselfish to spend the money on yourself. Dearest, here's your Hamilton. All my love, Peggy. Gee, Dad, aren't you going to kiss her? <laughs> For the Jim in your family or the Peggy, no gift means more than a Hamilton watch. Hamilton watches are priced from forty-nine fifty to twelve thousand dollars. See the wide selection of your jewelers, and remember. Someone you love is hoping for a Hamilton this Christmas. And I'll send you a happy new year. Oh, it's a it's a gray wintry day. Temperatures dipping down into the frigid mid sixties. Trees are hanging heavy with soot. We're in beautiful, sunny Southern California in the Mulholland Drive view shelf here at Falconland Recording Studios, recording live via Zoom all the way across town to the Eagle Rock District of of Los Angeles, California, talking to one of my favorite people. We not only share a birthday, but I think it's very fair to say we share deep, destructive pathologies. And so I'm happy to have her here. She, This is what I find interesting about uh, my guest today. Not long ago, you are an actress. You were on the cover of Los Angeles Magazine, and yet you can walk down the street, I'll, to use the phrase, unmolested. Please welcome uh, the lovely and talented Gray Delisle. This is the sound of my voice. Now, your voice is how people know you, although you are a a comedian, you're a musician, uh, but you are, uh, uh, safe to say, your bread and butter is... You are what is known as a voice actress. Yes. Uh, It's not my bread and butter, though, because I'm still trying to stay thin for um, all the on-camera work. Or two fond (laughs) memories. Um, uh, What are some of the... Now, for those... uh, How do people know your voice? 
Well, Jeepers, I've been playing Daphne Blake on Scooby-Doo since 1998. And um, that's really fun. And Vicky the Babysitter on the Fairly Odd Parents. <laughs> and me, oh, I'm Catwoman on, well, for the past 10 years on all kinds of things. And, um, oh gosh, what else? Oh, what, Azula on Avatar The Last Airbender, which a lot of millennials like. I know a lot of the Avatar people. <laughs> Yeah. Janet Varney is Cora, which is in that yes. same universe. Yes, I was in Cora as well. I played a, um, a an armless waterbender. Is Cora gay? I think they, everybody wants her to be. I think, yeah, I think, yes. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to ship that. I think guys want all cartoon women to be gay when necessary. <laughs> um, I think guys want all women to be gay when necessary. Yeah, when necessary. But not the way they're gay in real life, the way guys want them to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> has no bearing whatsoever. And and, yes. Yeah, has no bearing whatsoever on real gay. Um, yes. And you're now on the cast of The Simpsons. Yes, I can't uh, believe that. Yeah, yes. and 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 how you came to be in The Simpsons is is is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting story in and of yes. itself. But I want to I want to backtrack first. How you came to be in showbiz is is uh, uh, is somewhat uh, uh, circuitous, and you have an interesting history uh your your dad was a truck driver if i'm not mistaken well no he just had a truck but it's so funny because i got interviewed like ages ago where i said like my in my dad's truck like he would play and so people were like her dad was a truck driver and he was not he was not he was, he was, not, a, he was a house painter not any more glamorous than right. a truck you, grew, driver. you grew up in southern california yes but not but sort of out of out of the not in the la basin well, it's funny because East County, San Diego may as well be Oklahoma or something. Right. I mean, That's what I mean. Really... Yeah. It's you're out in the sticks. <laughs> you really are. And people yeah. are like, oh, but but I really identify so much. Well, And, and my, my dad's family is, you know, my, my, my grandmother was a Texan. So I was raised by a Texan, a, a Mexican Texan who was very right. self-hating Mexican woman. She would always be like, you're a Tex-Mex. I'm a Tex-Mex. She would never like she she lied and said she was Italian all the time because, you know, there was so much racism when she was growing up. So um, she was very uh, she oh, every time it, I yeah. out. She was like, get in here. Get in here, Negrita. You know, she didn't want me. She's like, I married a white man so that my children would be white. And it's just, it was just awful. There was a lot of like weird. Oh, that's it. I didn't realize that, that there was a, that I guess this was in the seventies or eighties. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Seven, late seventies, eighties. Yeah, yeah. Late seventies, early eighties. And, uh, she was sort of, uh, high, uh, self, I wouldn't, I would want to say self-loathing. Yes, but uh, but she did. She lied. She she and also she would if people spoke Spanish to her. Like if we went to a Mexican restaurant and the busboy or somebody tried to speak Spanish to her, she would get really offended about it. You know, she and I it was just awful. I yeah. Well, that's so funny she, because because white people, you know, we you have that thing where you just uh, you throw everybody in, a, in in a group. Like, well, I guess all Latino people are this way. I guess all black people are this way. You know, yeah, that, that was yeah. why in the election they like, and I'm one of the like in the election. I couldn't understand that that any black person would vote for Trump as the numbers actually went up after four years of institutional racism. So you, you can't uh, mo- like monolithic. monolithic. Yes, yeah, monolithic, monolithic was the word yes. I was looking for. Yeah, it's not <laughs> monolithic. And you're uh, so uh, I read that your uh, your your mother was uh, Pentecostal. Yes. What is she was she what was a is terrible that? drug addict and alcoholic when I was really little. So my grandma Now we're getting amazing. into our areas of common ground. So oh, let's go. Oh yes, <laughs> it's delicious. Um I feel yes, like we should my... both be in folding chair and there should be bad <laughs> sugar cookies nearby. <laughs> Yes, and like sh- crap coffee. Are we allowed to cuss on here? I don't. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. It's a podcast. Um, okay, good, good. Because I'm a single mother you with three children. You haven't, and I, I haven't, you seen haven't another done. adult in a long time. I'm like fucking cunt, motherfucker. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> well, you can't say um, motherfucker, but you can say sorry, fucking oh, and cunt. Okay, yeah, because all the mothers will pick it. Um, no, Do yeah, people, no, I, okay. Now I used say, to always now say, say like, cunt is Daphne. No, I'm kidding. I don't want to hear it. Um, <laughs> oh, there's so much gross. Oh, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Um, yeah, 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 no, no there's I, a lot of, uh, well, we'll get into that or hopefully not. I used to joke about my, you know, those bad, I like my men, like my coffee jokes. People like, you know, like I like yeah. my men, like my coffee, you know, strong and black or whatever. Right. But I was, I was like, I like my men, like my coffee, um, just like shitty and, and old and from the local AA meeting. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, I was the an best one I heard. The best one yeah. I heard, the best one I heard was by a guy named uh, Mike Farrell. Not the actor on MASH. Uh, stand-up comedian was, uh, I like my coffee the way I like my women. With big tits. 
<laughs> yeah, it's great. That's sort of the aristocrats of uh, yes, Trump exactly. Yeah, that would be funny uh, if at the end of Trump's uh, term he just turned to the camera and went, "The aristocrats." That would make the whole thing make sense. Uh, <laughs> then it would all make sense. Um, oh God! Yeah. yeah, but so you you grow up in kind of like the sticks in East San Diego, and uh, your your parents are together. And they're not together. No, they got divorced when I was two. It's so funny. I and have you blame pictures yourself. of them at their wedding. Oh, is that the same same as you? No, Wait, but what? I was like, you blame yourself for the. Oh yeah. No, my parents. Are, no, my parents are. Uh, <laughs> what a still... shit two year old I was! I really <laughs> ruined their relationship. Um, you, had well, you had one our... job. You had one job. Keep them <laughs> I was together. Born with the you job failed. too to keep them together. <laughs> I was the I was the glue that was going to save everything. Um, no, I yeah no they, I don't even remember them. Ever. I've never seen them touch each other. It's so weird. I look at their wedding pictures. Sometimes I forget they know each other because they're so vastly different. Uh, yeah, I understand um, that. My my youngest doesn't really have any memory of my. My ex-wife and I as a couple, which is, yeah. to me, bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I see their wedding pictures. And I'm like, wow, yeah, you guys, like, kissed each other. That's weird. And people um, do. But, 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 but that's an interesting thing because you've also been uh, divorced. Yes. Um, so many times. So many times. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> I just you're really like, like <laughs> three to, three to people one. People want to marry me, Dana. I just don't. <laughs> My sister kind of gave me a little, like, she was getting married and she made, like, some joke about how many times I've been married. And I was like, yeah, I guess a lot of people want to marry me and not you. So um, <laughs> she didn't get married till she was in her late 30s. We don't well, speak you, anymore. She's a Trump lady and I just can't. Yeah, yeah. Well, that ha- that's an- well, that's another thing. I had to write down all the things we're going to get to, which yes. is the great great thing about having you on the podcast. Is all the that, time. We uh, could never talk at sessions. So you played my dad on the Mighty Magiswords and I was so excited. But yeah. I, then I realized I can't talk to Dana because we're recording it starts this show is getting in the way of my friendship with dana and it's bothering (laughs) me yes anyway (laughs) but but uh yeah well the the the, that has split up uh, a lot of families so your parents get divorced you're with your mommy or dad mostly my my grandmother actually your grandmother yeah Yeah, that's that's what i find interesting yeah now neither parent really picks up the slack and you're how old and well it's sort of a straight line into show business from this beginning (laughs) Like, how did you get your start? Well, yeah. rampant Why are alcoholism you a and drug addiction. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I learned. I was telling my friend how I was like, you become a chameleon growing up like that because you're like, how do I fit into your scenario? I just want to make things okay right, right. now. And I'm such a people pleaser, you know. Right. Um, well, that's, that is the thing that we bonded over when we first yes. met was you have that, I, you know, I'm a child and you're an adult. But let's yeah. not kid ourselves. Your feelings are my responsibility. So <laughs> let me... Let me twist work, myself work, work, into work. what you need. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hello, never... my honey. Hello, my baby. Hello, my ragtime gal. Yeah. Every time I dated cane. a new guy for a while, like my friend joked with me because, like, whatever that person was into, two days into the relationship or whatever, and I would change my entire music sure. collection, hobbies, like whatever. What can I? Uh, what would you like? I'll have it for you by Tuesday. I can yeah. be what you want me to be. Um, and the yeah, good thing about was... that is it doesn't eventually lead to massive resentment. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Oh God, yes. And lots of yeah, and a lot of this investment in things that I'm never going to be interested in. Like you know, I, yeah. I guess I'll throw all these out. But yeah, my friend, this guy. Why do I have all. three boomerangs? <laughs> <laughs> I hate golf people. I don't like oh, golf yeah, yeah. guys. But Me I dated neither, a golf yeah. guy for a minute, and my friend goes, "So when does golf camp start?" Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we now she has that joke. Anytime I date somebody new, she's like, "When does golf camp start?" No, but I've been good about it. Now I stick to. I'm who I am. It is great when you meet somebody when you're older and you're an adult and you kind of put your shit together. Like uh, Kat, my my better half, who you know. I love her, yes. Yeah, Kat is a a whiskey expert. Yes, I and know. I've been watching your Instagram yeah. videos. Okay, well, there you go. Yes. And, you know, to me, it's all different flavors. It's just different shades of witch hazel. Yes. I, have... I don't, yeah, I don't drink at all. I mean, I yeah. didn't have my first drink until I was like late 30s because I was terrified of becoming my mother. So. Sure. No, I, I believe yeah. me. I believe me. Yeah. And that's like, I'll, I'll sip the stuff and I have no, I mean, it's great that I don't have the proclivity because it's yeah. all over the place in the house. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> You know, if she was a if she was a, a cookie taster, I'd be in big trouble. Oh God, um, I know me too. Yeah, yeah but uh, but it's great because I can fully 
enjoy and I, and I'm fascinated by the history of it and the, and the way it, 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 it's influenced in cultures and the way it was, a it, uh, you know, whiskey in the, in the, you know, in, in history, especially in Europe was a, a social currency. And, uh, oh, you know, it I was, didn't even know yeah, it's very important. See, yeah. Learning. Very important, especially in Scot- Scotland and Ireland. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it's definitely figures in history and, and, and that stuff is fascinating, but, but I don't have to get into it. I can appreciate that she likes it. And she and doesn't I have don't... to know who Mike Nesmith is. And that's what... <laughs> I loved that part of the video. She's... Sorry for those of you who don't, haven't seen the video. It's very cute because she's like doing her and she's telling him all about bourbon and or whiskey or I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, d- but then Dana goes, yeah, and it's just sort of like it's because it was like monkey shoulder or yeah, whatever. Exactly, and he exactly, said something yeah. about Mike Nesmith and she goes, who, who even is that? Anyway, she was <laughs> haunted, just, haunted I, by that. It by made the... me feel so good because I'm. I, she's so gorgeous and she's so smart and she's so funny and beautiful and i'm just like ah, this girl's perfect and then when she didn't know who mike ness i was like good there, okay she's got Finally. she's got a flaw there's a flaw <laughs> and i i want to it makes her even more adorable though because i'm like i like I don't, I don't, we don't want the two perfect exactly yeah. um well she stuck with me so the poor woman did something <laughs> the poor woman did something in a past life um, <laughs> yeah but you're right you don't it, now now they're older and self-actualized we don't need somebody to be a mirror of us or like have yeah, all of like, our hey, same great. you can yeah you can be into yeah. that and i don't yeah. need to i don't need to uh you don't need to uh i don't need to become you i can just yes. enjoy you yes. <laughs> I'm going to envelop you. Yeah, and we will become one. I will eat you. I, I, no, um, yeah, no. I yeah. And also, me. it's almost we've all been there. But it's better on, almost now that when someone's just or disagrees with you, for God's sake, you know, like you know, when God, when people are trying to impress each other, it was like, oh, me too. I like that thing too. I like yeah. whatever you like, you know. And right. it's so nice when someone's confident enough to go, oh no, that's yeah. uh, no, I would never. That's yeah. you're full of shit. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Right, you know? polar bear mating. What's not interesting about it? You know, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Now, are you currently uh, single, or are you currently? Yeah, uh, I'm single. Yeah, but I, yeah. I, I've been having little Zoom dates with. Yeah, the, well, that's people what, in New York. Do, I mean. Uh, none of my business. Um, <laughs> oh no, I love to talk about it. It's I love. I'll tell you anything. But um, do you? Uh, do you? Are you on an? Uh, I've never gone to apps. I've I've never gone to apps. I dipped a toe uh, in it. I dipped a toe in it, and yeah. I just couldn't. I was. So I'm on. Uh, I was on cringe. For a while, which is, <laughs> it's four straight people, but all the women look like Harvey Keitel. It's a very specific. I love that. That is perfect. Oh my god! Um, <clears throat> my friend was calling. She said I, I was on Hinder, which is where you just I don't know, just like where you just throw out all the bad things about you, like you say yeah. everything why you should not be dated. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, no, I I, I was on so... I was on Shemp for a while. Where I'll, <laughs> Women who look like what you imagine the Three Stooges' wives look like. Um, uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't. I think. I think it would. I think me on a dating website when I was single would be like me dating a cookie taster. Like, yeah, probably not good. Yeah. Yes. Well. Uh, yeah. I. I had like a very good time the first day that I joined it because that's what all the like kind of cute people are on there are just like sure. oh, this is not bad. These are actually you know. And right. then um and then you and then. And then, like after about, two and then hours, you get down like, to the William is... Frawley lookalikes. <laughs> but then I'm like, oh, this is, and I, I keep quitting it. Like I'll start talking to somebody, and then I feel bad because they probably think, what the hell happened to that girl I was talking to? But honestly, if you're not interesting in the first, the first time you write to me, it better not be like, how's your day, beautiful, or whatever. I just, ugh, I no. How, I just... Do you mind if I ask you how that works? It is genuine. I am genuinely curious about it. Uh, you like, have to be funny you, right out of you, the gate, or I'm yeah. And you just say like, you're like, hey, I saw your photo. You look interesting. Is it something like that? Or okay, I'll give you the first sentence can be something just. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it. I yeah, would just but, be like, but, if, if it, I kill it, you, do I become you? Like, I try to get something interesting. <laughs> I so. probably would write back to you after that. Just be like, hmm. And that's the Alan on in me. Like, what's behind this <laughs> sure, yeah. crazy door? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this, yeah. Anyway, uh, these these healthy people seem very boring. Um, yeah, yeah, I uh, no, I yeah, I, I would have a couple exchanges, and then I thought, no, no, I can't. Yeah. I, so because and then I joined because it was a lot of on Bumble. I was only on it for a very short time, but there was just too many like which I, I call them Kevin's who are 
commercial real estate people Kevin's. because whenever I forget someone's name, they're Kevin. Sure. I just I just always fill it in with Kevin. And also for their job, because if it's not something in the arts, I always think, yeah, Kevin, doesn't he do like commercial real estate or something? Every normal person in my life, like at father at the school or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't like, know no, how to talk. That guy's to... name's not Kevin, and no, he yeah. doesn't do commercial real estate. But to me, that's just the fill in job and name for people that are not interesting. I hear to you. Me. Like they're just not artsy or they don't have something. Right. Or, um, or so, Craig. Oh, Craig. <laughs> But the one Craig that I'm talking to right now, I don't want to offend him. Um, he's an actor and fun. Yeah. And I Zoom him. He's in New York. Yeah. Um, anyway, I have so these Zoom dates. I have yeah, a very full Zoom, Zoom dating life. What is a Zoom date? That's good because the only virus you catch, you just need to call Norton Utilities. You don't have to. <laughs> well, I, I, order, I order sushi. You don't have orders. to go buy yeah, any no. special shampoo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's no salve involved. Yeah, exactly. um, <laughs> Um, no, yeah, I order sushi, he, but he's in New York too. So I'm always like, do you want to like, should I zoom you at five? You know, because he's like, yeah, exactly. I can't stay up all night. It's like a sizzler date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's have dinner at five. The early bird. Yeah. Matt locks on at eight. So let's eat at five. <laughs> There's a fun man who lives. It's always in the hot to park. <laughs> I, w- I used to go like have picnic, like when the lockdown was early on, like a, you know, maybe over the summer, right. my friend. My another man friend who has a beautiful place on Mulholland. You live on Mulholland, right? I do. Should yeah. I just give everybody your address so they can just find you? <laughs> they know I'm um, off Mulholland, but you can always come by. You're always packages. welcome. Well, we used to have like a picnic, a very safe picnic. You know, we, I mm-hmm. would bring my food and my coffee and we would sit on a blanket outside. But then right. one day he he walked me to my car and touched my back and I screamed. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't very sexy. Yeah. So anyway, we did. Anyway, my Zoom. My yeah. Zoom I always my... assume that uh, 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 the short, the shortest distance between uh, a smile and a rape whistle is me opening my mouth or moving my hand. <laughs> it's just, it goes right to rape whistle. <laughs> well, I was telling my son, like when you're with a girl, you know, just. If, well, not during COVID times, but in regular times, right. I was like, you can tell if you can go in for the kiss. He hasn't kissed anybody. He's 14. Um, yeah. But I was like, you can go in for the kiss if you t- just t- touch, like have your finger like graze her hand or something like that. If she doesn't immediately recoil, you probably have a shot. Like if she leaves oh, her hand that's, there. See, no one ever told me these things. Yeah, I'm a good, I'm good, I'm a good mom for the dating advice. Right. Know? Also, I told him, like, if a girl cancels a plan and doesn't go, but can we do it month? You know, like, if they don't, they don't, you know, if they don't reschedule, mm-hmm. just, it's, that's canceling. Right, that's yeah, yeah. Oh, the, see, no, I never, yeah, there's a lot of little I never tricks. knew, and yeah, most of my, uh, most of my dating knowledge was picked up watching National Geographic specials of fluke whale mating. So it was, <laughs> a lot, a lot of the so, signs I read involved a spout, and I was really off. You keep trying to get them in the jacuzzi so you can <laughs> mount them aquatically. Yeah. See if yes. they're spouting. <laughs> uh, I was, yeah, I was really forlorn. A um, barnacle. So, it's like, oh no, I got a barnacle from that girl. <laughs> <laughs> and a date, and the zoom, and the zoom date is you t- you eat your. Chatting and I just sit you're like eating. right here and I just right. have my sushi on my lap and I just eat. And so the man on the mountain, I still talk to him Zoomy, Zoom wise. Right. And the man in New York, I talk to him occasionally. And when this lockdown that... ends, I'm gonna have some important decisions to make. No, yeah. I don't know. They're they're See, mostly I'm just wondering, friends. but but I'm also wondering like when the lockdown ends, are we gonna go fully back? Or like cause a lot of Zoom like I've found that a lot of work I can do from home on Zoom. Yes. I'm writing with someone and I'm writing with someone right now uh, in New York and yeah. we just meet in the morning. We put on the headsets, we click and we share a screen and we work for three or four hours and they're like, all right, see you tomorrow. And it's great. He's really uh, a great collaborator and uh, yeah. it's, easy. it's just as easy as sitting in a room. I'm building, I bought 13 acres of land in Sisters, Oregon, which is this beautiful central mm-hmm. Oregon town. No, I saw that on your Instagram. I'm very, I've been good with real estate. I, I started out with like a little teeny tiny house on Chandler in Burbank and then, and it was like right. only $100,000 or something. And then I kept right. trying to, I, real estate, my because I never, I never had my own room when well, I was yeah, real I estate. No, real estate is good because it's never going away. I know and there's it. always and a demand. You ever lose money on it. You know, if right. you hold on to it for at least 10 years, you're probably going to. 
But my grandma and I, I always wanted to put a picture on the wall. You know, I just wanted to right. paint. I wanted to paint. And right. grandma would go, no, 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 no. Me hit them. With, they're they're going to get mad. The landlord, you know, right, and I was yeah. always like, I'm To not gonna... have a landlord. Once you yes. own, it's like, that's it. I can't go back. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to put someone. I've got, I've got a gallery wall with all the holes right. in it. Yeah. So I just always said, someday I'm going to own a house and I'm going to paint the walls whatever damn color I want and put up art. And that was like really my only goal. So right. when I bought my house, I mean, I was pretty young. You know, I just started doing voiceovers. Right. Yeah, and so then I just, anytime a property came up or something, like, you know, I'd always try to do that. Right. And then I start renting it out, so then it's an income. I have a place at the Castle Green in, in Pasadena, that old right. hotel, you know. And right. That's, and that, I, you know. I'm that familiar. Way, I've got great tenants. I've got, I'm a good And it's a, it's, a hotel, it's, it's a hotel, but people live in it? It's converted into condos now, so each, right. each little hotel room is like a little cute little, they're very small, but they're so charming. Anyway, right. it's like. Uh, but no, I bought this land. I'm building this A-frame, and I'm going to fill it with Haywood Wakefield and like sort of like 50s right. cabin stuff. And um, and I'm going to have like house concerts out there and everything. But my point is, I made the the top of the A is like a little tiny recording studio, <clears throat> right? So I can and because I used to be just like so bad with like. Obviously, like I was telling you, this is my first computer I've ever owned in my whole entire life. This little <laughs> laptop, which I'm, you know, I'm cheap. I'm not cheap. No, like you're not cheap. I've I'm been not in your cheap house. When it comes to- <laughs> well, but if I if I can save money and if it's not necessary to spend the money, I'm I'm all right. about I'm ready to to make have the deal. I like the deal. It makes me sick. Like if I find out that I could have gotten something for ten dollars cheap, even ten dollars, really? I'm like, oh. Um, but so I was like, well, I'm going to go on Amazon, I guess, and try to find a computer. So I found this really great deal on the computer. It was like four hundred dollars. What is <laughs> a it? Mac 2020? Laptop. Yes. <laughs> well, because it was 2014, which I didn't right. know. But I had a guy zooming in to, to try to help fix my computer because I was trying to get Yeah, sometimes you just got to spend the money. I know. But it's yeah. working, Dana. It has been a year. Well, because the guy, I was yeah. he started laughing. Is he it like, like a where K-Pro? Did you get this? Is it like a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he goes, where did you get this computer? And I go, well, it was like $300 on, or $400 on, on, on Amazon. And he goes, okay. And I go, is it not going to work for the car too? He goes, well, it's like you... It's like you have a job. It's like you have a car that goes maximum speed 75 miles per hour. And I was like, okay. He goes, but you have a job that requires you to drive 74 miles per hour all day long. Right. <laughs> I was like, okay, but we still have an, an, a mile in mm-hmm. there. That <laughs> with yeah, our, I understand has, what he's saying, actually. Yeah, it's been working for a year almost. You, know, you could we, also make them buy you one. Don't you do enough voices for Disney? Can't you just? Well, they were sending a computer for a while, but I'm so I was trying to set it up. I I just said I just I'm gonna buy a computer. I'm gonna pay <laughs> someone to set the whole thing up. Don't touch anything like every time because this is my son's art studio. You can see like his art behind me. I yeah, know. I was wondering whose art that was. It yeah. all looks like the uh, Armed it, Forces it, cover. <laughs> it's it's like very Basquiat, you know. Yeah. Um. But uh. But I. But of course, text comes into her paint, and I'm like, don't touch my microphone because I can't have somebody. I don't know how to fix anything anyway. Right. So, it is interesting that you get that you got the computer so late. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh yeah, just, and also I thought I'm not going to spend a thousand dollars on a computer that I'm going to use for what? What will we be in this? Three weeks? I mean, I I didn't realize yeah. how long this was going. This was going to become my life. But the point is, now I know how to do my own auditions. I used to go to a place just to send my auditions because I was right. like, I don't know how. Can you push the button? And I just talk right. in the microphone. I mean, twenty yeah, bucks no, yeah. a day and on I, that. And I, yeah, it's frustrating. And I'm not as technically savvy as. Most people, as I learned know. when we were trying to set this call up, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but also, like in terms of like video, like ca- like people at cameras, like oh, we're gonna get some X five red cameras. I'm like, uh, okay, numbers and letters and things I don't yeah, understand. I don't. Yeah, there's a reason that I'm a writer and not a director. Yeah, just, if they like, called it, it like the the zoomerang or whatever. I'd be like, oh, okay, I know that. That's a word. I would know right. that. But if it's numbers and letters, my brain's just immediately like math. I don't understand. Yeah, I just check out. I just check out. They're like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, lenses and things like that. I don't know. Yeah, they should name them fun lenses. Like make for, it look good. Make yeah. it. I don't know. Like depth of field and things like that. I just yeah. I just check right out. I'm not. I'm not name. interested. If they had in a that. cute name. I would remember exactly what lens it was. <laughs> yeah, like I'm, I'm not, not like... that interested. But let's but, but let's go back. So okay. you're you're raised by your self loathing grandmother. <laughs> um, what is where was your mother at this point, and what is a Pentecostal? And what that's is a Pentecostal? Like that where was my mother? That's what the, is a what is a what is a drug addicted alcoholic Pentecostal? That's what is the, the question I there? ask every day in therapy. Um, no, um, she was like dating and having a great time, and God bless her, she had me when she was 
19 years old. So, right. I mean, like she should have been having fun. Poor thing. Um, but right. she was partying pretty hard. My children dad was having children. Service. Yes, yeah, children having children. Right. My dad was in the army, so he was, you know, doing that. And um, and were you, my grandma, were you growing up in an army town? Were you out there at? Uh... I was born on the army base in Fort Ord, in Fort Ord. Uh, in up in Monterey, right? Uh, okay. Which is closed down now, but it's so beautiful up there. Yeah, it is um, beautiful. I didn't yeah, know Fort Ord was closed. And then my dad remarried closed. a jerk, a woman that I can't stand, and so and she was that happens. Old, mean. Yes, and um and so so yeah, so it was grandma and I mostly, and we had a great time. Well, I, did I, you know where your mom was? Country. Did you know where your mom was? She would come in occasionally and take me on outings, but I have terrible mm. memories from that. God, I, I guess I can share them, but I have like yeah. horrific childhood memories of that kind of thing. And people are just like, oh, my God. And, you know, when you I like she take you to like, score, she would like not drugs. But I remember my grandma saying if if your mom b- goes to a store and buys anything that's in a bag that she doesn't take out and, st- and drives, you tell her to take you right home. <clears throat> uh-huh. So I remember – <clears throat> driving straight to the liquor store and she comes sure. out with the bag and the thing and i'm like sure. this is the thing that i was told about because i hadn't seen her in a while i was excited to see her and i didn't want to go back to my grandma's but i was like grandma said so i was like my grandma said that if you had a a, a bag with a th- that you had to take me home and she was like she started screaming at me and she d- pulled over on the freeway and g- she's like get out of the car get out of the car i think i was like six and i and so she and she drove away i was on the side of the road and I, I, I just, I remember, and it's those problem solving skills of like, okay, wow. what do we do now? Now we've got, okay. So I was like, well, I guess I'll just keep walking. I think I see a thing. And I mean, I remember all the, all the gymnastics of it. And then my mom came and pulled up and was really mad, but she's like, get in the car. God damn it. You know? And then she drove me back to my grandma's house. And I remember them screaming out on the porch of my, my grandma saying like, is this what you want her to see you? Like you're a mess, you know, you stay right. away if you can't, you know. You're alone on the freeway yeah. there for a few and minutes. I know. Well, grandma didn't really know that part yet. She right. probably would have. But no, but I have these like crazy memories, which just became – that's why I became the perfect specimen to fall in love with addicts and alcoholics. My sure. Whole life. I, I'll, <laughs> you preach into the choir. Let me fix it in this life. You know? yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. – um, but then I – but then Tex, my, my 13-year-old's – or almost 14-year-old's father is such a sweetheart and he – Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he, but he, I married him because I loved him as a person so much and there wasn't really much romance there. And so then uh-huh. I, I thought, it'll grow. You can do this, you know, and then, you know. The thing was I was afraid of him not being my friend anymore. That's how much of a people pleaser I was. Like I knew he had Oh, my feelings. God. You got – oh, okay. And so I you married with... somebody because they wanted – you married your first husband because you knew he wanted to marry you. Well, wait, wait, wait. There was a first husband in there. So there's a lot of husbands, Dana. Let's keep up. Okay. Um, no, no. First I of all, let me, in... let, let me interrupt. <laughs> <clears throat> I think I know more about your past marriages than you do. Let me just say that right. Let me mansplain your marriages to you. Okay. <laughs> I was 19 when I got this. married the first time. You did exactly what your I mother did. Did exactly what your mother did. Exactly. 1919. <laughs> but no, I met a really cute boy in acting school. Who we moved to LA after acting school. He modeled and acted. It was so funny because I kept his name. Delisle was his name, right. and I kind of kept it. And he kind of, you know, didn't he, Took he, off. he struggled in the acting business a little bit. But he, it was the thorn in his side every time he would like go to something or meet someone. By that time, I'd had like my right. cartoons oh, kind of like, taken. Are out. you related you know, to like, Great Delisle? <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's and he funny. would get mad. He was like, that's my name. She took that name. That's mine. Anyway, I had this horrible Dutch last and, But he's not Texas dad. No. Right. No, no. Um, he, Texas dad was in the old 97s. <laughs> yeah, Texas dad's in the old right. 97s. And he's right. wonderful. And he's still one of my dearest, dearest friends. And I right. love He's got a longtime girlfriend who I adore and who's been wonderful with our That's great when that happens. God, thank God for him because he's – because, you know, since we share text, we had to – kind of be a pod and so right. he, but and my kids adore him and they you know he, they'd rather go see uncle murray than anybody like than go right. to disneyland or and they're like they're like is it uncle murray day yet because once right. a week we go over there and he plays with them and runs around and i get like a tiny break you know i'm able to he's like mama just take a nap or whatever you're gonna do mm-hmm. you know <clears throat> so and we do music together we just did a, is it but is he funny he is funny because you really don't want funny. funny uncle you it's good to be <laughs> Because that, right, oh, that, then you're in another area that you don't want to have anything to do with. Yeah, I have a lot of those other uncles. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, he's very funny. And honestly, I couldn't have married him without that, like, I kept thinking, he's, he's you know, when someone's just great on, you're like, they're funny, he's handsome, he's talented. He, right. We, now, do you know Tom DeSavia? I, uh, Tom was their A&R guy, and he's one of I my know. favorite people, too. But he is, he and I are now very good friends. Oh. 
Oh, and, I love him. Uh, and then I saw him with a picture of your uh, ex-husband. I was like, oh, I know yes. that family. But it's yes, interesting like how, pe- our... how people intersect that way. Yeah, he's one of our dear friends, like for years and years. Yeah, he's a great he's a great guy. He's been on the show. He's a great guy. Oh, he ha- oh, oh, oh yeah. interesting. I interviewed so him and, okay. and well, yeah, well, he wrote a book with John Doe. You want to write a book oh, with so, John Doe? Well, I'll interview you. Well, I, I, I wrote several books with unknown, unknown cadavers. <laughs> what? Anyway. <laughs> John oh, Doe. yeah, I see. I see. I see. <laughs> see, I, to me, he's, to me, I forget that John Doe was a synonym for unknown. I know, no, I know. John Doe. Tex was like, that can't be his real name. I was like, it's kind of a punk rock name. Well, anyway. It's those poor, guy, those poor guys because John Doe, that name must be such a pain in the ass for him to deal with as he goes through life. And X is such a terrible name for the internet. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> you know, it's God. like they're X the band. So uh, it's, 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 they really, yeah, they really. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, I love uh, that um, Nate, Nate Bargatze joke where he was talking about like meeting that couple. I don't know if you know Nate Bargatze. I do know who he is. Yeah, I well, know he's he is. just so funny, and he was talking about how dumb he is. He's like, I'm just such a dumb person, and he's like, I, I met these. I used to work at a theme park, and I met this couple named Jane and John Doe, and I couldn't believe it. And I was, you know, they they were they, you know, we and for every day for 20 years, I've thought about those people. And he said, and then about a week ago, it occurred to me. I don't think that was their real name. I think they were just messing with me. <laughs> just, somebody uh, used to have a somebody used to have a joke. I can't remember who it was, but it was when someone's giving you a phone number, like ask them for a phone number. You're, sure, it's uh, it's one two three, four five six, seven eight nine ten. Call me up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you hate it when someone really wants to to connect with you, like in a social situation? They really want to, and 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 you don't want to give them your phone number, and oh, so yeah. you just say, "Well, I'll, we'll see each other. I'm going to see yeah, you. Like, I'll we're going to work together." And they're like, "Well, yeah. look, can I just get?" And it's like, "I'm going to." We're gonna see. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just. Call. Why don't you write to Sandy and then Sandy will give. Yeah. Yeah. Sandy's got my number. So just, uh, yeah, just call, call Sandy. Me. I'm, uh, it's like, just, yeah. Or just. <laughs> like, I come up why with can't a... you just do it right now? It's like yeah. no, I want you to go through some hoops because I really. Am I'm one two three at aol dot com. Just email me. Eight six seven five three zero nine. That's a joke for anyone over forty. Yeah, exactly. I got it. I got it. <laughs> So um, keep taking us off track. Dave. No, there is Bring no track. Back. There is no track. Back. There okay, is no good. track. Good. So you uh, did you ever reconcile with your mom, or did uh, or was that it? Well, like my dad would do that thing on Saturday. Like, you want to go for a ride in the truck? Because we had a pickup. Yeah, and is you know we out in the sticks. He was a truck driver then. <laughs> exactly, he was a truck driver. <laughs> We're out in the sticks, and yeah, riding in the back of the open pickup truck. With the dog was fun. Yeah. But he would go to the end of our street and turn right. And we're like, oh, shit. Uh Because we're going to the bar. Yeah. And and we'd have to hang out at the bar all day. Yeah. Um, And, uh, you know, it was fun for a while. Play pinball and eat Reese cups um, or Reese's. I call them Reese cups. Or Reese, whatever. I like that. That's cute. Uh, you know, so we, but it was just like, oh yeah. And that's what he would do. Like, you see my brothers and I up to the, to the bar and there was, you know, we kind of hang around outside the bar for a while. Um, I loved and, bars when I, my grandmother, of course, yes. she was married to every drunk too. So I, I, my yeah. grandfather was a terrible alcoholic. He died at 44. From drinking himself to death. Wow. Yeah. Hank Williams Sr. died at 27, drank himself to death at 27. I know. I was just watching the Ken Burns. Of his many accomplishments, thing. that's the biggest, I think. I know. That 27 rule, man. The yeah. Ones, you know, the whole thing. Um, but, but, uh, but, I, but my grandma would, her second, my first grandfather drank himself to death at 44. Then she hooked up with another guy who was adorable. He was like a sweet, well, he, they fought all the time, but he was so sweet to me. I loved him. Scott, mm-hmm. Scotty, Scotty McKenzie. And, um, but she'd right. always get pissed off that she'd made dinner and he was still at the bar. So she'd send me in to go get him. Right. And, and, and then there. she'd have to come get me because I loved drunks. And so I was in there, you know, <laughs> eight years old, like, I'd make right. him laugh. I was. They were like, this kid is – they picked me up, put me up on the bar, like sing a song because all the drunks loved me and I was having the great right. time. So then my grandma would come in, you know, smoke. And that also – I had a different version of that, but that's also, oh, this is how I get people to like me. Oh, yes. And that first – those laughs. I don't care if they're drunk yeah, or not. They're just – Sure. Oh, I, I had very similar – very oh, yeah. similar uh, – I had an impression of Richard Nixon. <laughs> That I did. And, you know, again, same age, eight, nine. Yeah. 
at 10 and uh and that was my go-to and my dad would have friends over the house and they'd say do nixon and i would and uh, they'd get a laugh and bang it was like okay no no need for freud here I, yes. a to b mine was butterfly mcqueen from um gone with i go wow oh, i don't know nothing about birthing and babies yeah. <laughs> Scarlet, she helped a little it's probably not very pc right now i'm not gonna yeah. <laughs> um, but i did uh, you were canceled as a child <laughs> You're okay as an adult, but your childhood has been canceled. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I oh god, I, my my dad was such a redneck that he taught like all my first five jokes I ever learned were horribly oh of course awful. like I'm I'm just like oh god I, and I of course when you're little you tell them you have no idea why they're hilarious you know to some people and then hor- horrifying to oh, yeah. others and so I'm like hmm. anyway but yeah now I, now I'm very regretful of those I'm glad there was no Twitter when I was eight uh, but, you know um, my mother my mother is from Virginia and her mother uh, you know was born and raised and. Uh, yeah, I uh you know, I would hear words that you can't say oh yeah every day. Yes. And in common common also, parlance. Also, Brazil nuts had a certain name that yeah. I didn't know that was not their name and it was like, oh god, hard. Sure. Back. Yeah, same. Anyway, yeah. But then I would also do um The Wizard of Oz. That was how I, that was my Nixon. Grandma would right. parade me in front of her and be like, "Do do the Dorothy, do the Dorothy." And I did that all the way up until through high school, and I just put it in my comedy special, my my Dorothy impression. My, <laughs> I want to go home. I want to go home. And I'm Uncle Henry. I'm frightened. And I do all the, every, You're the only you woman. The that, you're the only woman that does Judy Garland <laughs> of the seven thousand Judy Garland and, impersonators. And the only woman who sings "Crazy" by Patsy Cline. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you're, you're like There's you're like a dra- you're like a drag performer with a proper uh, with a proper genitalia, <laughs> well, with the right plumbing. So far plumbing. as we know. As far yeah. as we know, I've never. <laughs> I've. Uh, uh, your eyes are up teeth. here. That's my motto. Your eyes are up teeth. here. Yeah, but it's but it's there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Judy wanted to go home. Dorothy wanted to go home because that's where the barbiturates were. <laughs> and she bitched and complained, and finally they sent her home. <laughs> <laughs> that, is a good, that is a good Judy Garland. And it is weird to see a woman doing Judy Garland. I'm so used to <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. I, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I do it. Like, that's I've used all those voices for so long. Like, I, anyway. And you uh, and did you get right? And you didn't go right into voice acting, but it was one of those things where you kind of fell into it. I did and... well. I did one radio commercial. I did that Nancy Reagan, this horrible Nancy Reagan movie when I was 14. Uh, you just just say no to drugs. Right. And um, and then somebody was looking for a girl to do the voice of the Caboodles Beauty Organizers. And so they said, great, can you? So I went out and I was like, oh, my God, I just made $800 in five minutes. I can't believe this is amazing. Right. So I was like, remember that for later. <laughs> and uh-huh. I, I, able, I bought my car with it and everything. Like I, right. I was like, wow, five minutes and I've got my I don't have to work a whole summer to buy a car. Um, and then, uh, so then when I moved to LA, I, st- I was doing stand up, and I did, I just did like open mics and stuff, but, but I was at the comedy store mm-hmm. and Mitzi. And about Shore, what year is this? 96. Okay. So I was around. Yeah. But I was, yeah, I was terrible. I, I wouldn't, no, I wasn't at the, but oh. I didn't go to the comedy store either. Oh, and, oh, and the, and the open mics were horrible. It was just yeah. like, oh, no, I was never, uh, never terrible. went there. Yeah. Um, but but Mitzi was like, you are funny, but you you do great impressions. You should do that. Do voiceovers while you're working on your jokes because you have to write jokes. That's you, have like, no you know, for for Mitzi, that's actually good advice. Yeah. And normally for Mitzi, I was like, you need to do your act from a hot air balloon. <laughs> She said, you have no act. You have no act. Anyway, no, yeah, so, her uh, advice to me was, you, have, you do a lot of funny voices. You should have puppets. <laughs> like, all right, I'm going to go back down to the improv. <laughs> If you're cool with that, you should have pop. No, it's true. It, it was true. I was, and I was, I was, you know, I went to the improv and I passed at the improv, and then, uh, uh, and then I went up to the comedy store and they said, uh, "You need puppets." And I went, "I'm going to go back to the improv. How about this instead? I don't, <laughs> I, I don't work here. Yeah. I have an idea for my act. I have an idea for it at another building. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like comedy, stand-up comedy. It, it's 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 as I've said, it, it's like being a stripper, but without all the dignity. So, and I was a stripper, so I should know. Oh, Gray, I don't want to know this. We're moving right on. <laughs> I used to sing because I, I wasn't good at the pole or all the like. Did, were you really? Are you, are you I was. talking my. Uh, That's how I got the money for my demo tape. I was. 
for your singing houses. demo or your voiceover? No, demo my voiceover tape? demo tape. Because I, okay. I, oh God, it's a great, it's a funny story. Can I? Do we have time? I, I wonder know. if that's how Harry Shearer started. <laughs> Sure, was what he did to his <laughs> Dan Castellaneta. Yeah, yeah. Dan Castellaneta Dan was a Jumbos. Dan Castellaneta worked at Jumbos. It used to be a hairy pussy, but he sheared it off, and that was, that was, his, that was his name. His stripper name. Uh, no, um, no, I was, I was, I was cleaning houses. His stripper was, name was his, his stripper name was Unnecessary she- Merkin. It took a while to figure it out. <laughs> Oh God! No, that was his was, backup band. I, I was cleaning houses, doing singing telegram. Max her, Max her suit, and the unnecessary <laughs> Merkins. That was his band. <laughs> her suit. I haven't heard that word in since I, <laughs> since my last uh, porn. I suit. use it whenever describing um, my forearms. <laughs> that's what I punch in. That's those are my search words. Um, yeah. Okay, so no. so you're so tell as much of this as you feel comfortable telling. I was like, I was cleaning houses. I was doing singing telegrams. I was hosting it. Doing, so doing singing telegrams. Yeah, but th- that was on the up and up, like like a cute little like. Right. Bell I didn't even suit. know they still were singing telegrams. Nothing, nothing. Is this eighties? Uh, no, nineties. No, nineties. No, no. I'm. Yeah. I was born in. I was born there were telegrams in the nineties. Yeah. Oh yeah. I actually got to go work at the... We uh, regret to inform you your son has been killed in Afghanistan. (laughs) U.S. Parliament of Defense. Oh, my God. Oh, God. The I'm sorry singing telegrams were the worst because you were always singing to some woman going, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, well, he should have thought of that. So, okay, no, go ahead. You know, just, it was just, it was a hostile work environment. Awful. No, but I still remember all the songs like H-A-P-P-P-Y, B-I-R-T-H-D-A-Y, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Boop. I mean, just all those. Anyway, that's good. I'd, mm. I'd be happy to get that. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I was doing all these crap jobs. I was a hostess at right. Chin Chin on Chin Chin in Studio City. Um, uh huh. Still there. And making yeah, making minimum wage. One of and, the uh, one of Studio City's five businesses. I know. Still open. I know. God, it's so sad. Here in Omega Man Land. <sighs> it's like everything's turning into a Halloween town. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said. I think it was. My friend uh, uh, said, uh, said, I don't want to say my heart is empty, but they just put a spirit Halloween store in there. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Uh, No, but I just, I needed a demo tape. I think Jeff May said that. (laughs) It's good. Get your, get your credits in there. Yeah, I want a credit where it's due. he used my joke on his, (laughs) anyway. um, Volker. Um, So. Yeah, so I, I needed like twelve hundred dollars for my demo tape, and I was like, "No way! That would it would take me a whole month of just hostessing mm-hmm. to make that." I, I, yeah. So my friend said, "Hey, at the Deja Vu, they're just building this strip club down on Coldwater, and the, and the fifteen hundred dollars is the prize money if you win the amateur contest." And I was like, "What? I could never on Coldwater like, on Coldwater and Raymer. Where's Raymer? I don't know if it's still there. Is it way out by the air? Out it was by very like industrial. Oxnard? It yeah, was yeah. industrial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the one on the one on Sunset. You're like my you know all friends. The- <laughs> well, my friend's wife used to work there. Drake say the late great Drake Sather's wife used to work there. Is that the body shop on Sunset? I don't know what it is now. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Um, yeah, no, but so I I went there. And I had no. I mean, they were not amateurs. They, they that's very. Yeah, misleading. these people. Yeah, yeah there's. Yeah, they're. Like and you can tell by they're just like their eyes are dead. That's how yeah, you know they're good. Dead. That's how they, you know they're good. Professionally gigantic boobs, right? Like extensions, like t- yeah, spray they, tan, they know what they're doing. Yeah, clear they heels, pyrotechnics. There was a girl with sparklers, and they know how to be upside down right. on the thing. But this little brunette in Target underwear, I, 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 I was like, I'm gonna get. I'm going to get a thong because I never had anything like that. And I was like, I'm going to go to yeah. Target and really splurge. So I, bought, I have my Target bra and panties and like the highest heels that I own and a, and a plan. So I, I got there like as soon as it opened and I started working the crowd. Like, so I was like, hey, I really want to do voiceovers. I do. Vo-, and people were like, OK, sh- so show me some voices. So I was doing voices for everybody. And by the time I, 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 I just talked to almost every person in the entire right. club, doing voices for them, telling them what my story was. I needed a demo tape. Da, da, da. And so I was like, so will you please vote for me? When I go up there, because I'm going to, this is my first time, I've never done this. And so these girls couldn't believe it because right. you know, they went down the line. Like, is it this amazing person who did cartwheels and all this stuff and with these giant boobs? No. Like, smattering, 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 and all the way down the line to me. And then the place just goes crazy. So I won the $1,500 and I got my demo. Then I was like, I'm going to work here for a while because where else can you make this kind of money? This is incredible. So I, I made, I, I worked there for like three months and, and like made 60 grand or something. Holy Lord. I know. By yeah, the end of the three of months, were you 
my butt was raw. I was just well, the well, the, yeah. Were you like the hardened pro? Like were you like just like looking at those other the spray tan? Like hey, uh, uh. no, I was still the chatty one that nobody liked. I was I'd had no <laughs> friends at that place. There was one girl who she came. I, there was nobody in the club, so I was watching her dance because there was just nothing to do but watch her. And she came out, and she had a real small upper body, but this really big butt. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, wow, she's got a big butt. And so then the, the, the DJ said, that was Raven. She was just featured in this month's issue of Big Butt Magazine. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I was in the dressing room. We happened to be in there together, and I was trying to make her friend. So I said— Next month, John Houseman. <laughs> but I it's just like, trying- it's not women. It's just anybody with a big butt. Like, you know, it's like Mort Saul. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, um— but I but I just said um wow that so so big butt magazine huh that's that's pretty cool <laughs> and she looked at me with this horrified expression and went went big bust and I was like <laughs> <laughs> uh, nobody liked me is my point big butt is where I print my editorials but, but, <laughs> but Tupac used to come in he loved me I didn't know who uh, he was yeah I when, didn't know who he was until when he died. Drake's uh, when Drake's wife worked at uh, I think it was Deja Vu I it was on Sunset it was not on the side street it was right on Sunset yeah and it's still I think it's still there yeah uh, the, Billy I Idol watch. used to come in all the time oh wow yeah. to her table. But I had no idea who Tupac was. I just knew he was really nice and very generous. And like, and I always, yeah. I would sing since I didn't know how to do any tricks. I would get like old Harry Connick kar- karaoke CDs and just like, you know, miss the Saturday. Dinner. It would be funny you know, if that's if, yeah, if everybody else is like <laughs> dancing into Sister Christian and you come out like. like it's true. It was like cherry pie. Miss the Saturday and then, night. And then Duke Ellington, you know. Yeah. Yeah. that Well, that's, I would admire. Yeah. Or like yeah. the. A <laughs> uh, dance to every version of the Lost in Space theme. All the ironic. I'm the ironic stripper. Yeah. Or like the old <laughs> Quinn Martin TV spy themes. They come out to Columbo <laughs> and segue into McLeod. <laughs> show tunes now is that is that this is the this is the most uh, vaguely inappropriate question i'll ask is that uh is there a point where the only thing you're wearing is shoes or do you keep oh, stuff on yeah because they had no alcohol oh. so it was totally new all right and how do you the first time that happens i think you must feel that must be like a crossing the rubicon it's sort of thing yeah but but i don't know and then you so get funny. bored of it i think uh, yeah, you become, well then then in your regular you can always tell strippers in regular Well, it's like life. Trump. It's like Trump. After all, you just become desensitized to it. <laughs> you know, it's like right now half the government is half the government is protesting for the overthrow of an election. It's a historically and people are like, yeah. But it, I know. It, I told it, Tex, yeah. I told my son I was like, "Did you hear what he did?" And Tex was like, "What?" And I was like, "He took a shit in the middle on his chair." He was being interviewed mm. in the Oval Office and he stood on his chair and took a shit. And Tex goes, oh. And I go, he didn't do that, but you didn't even question it. Yeah, did you don't you? even you flinch. Didn't. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, was that like, was. I can't believe it. And I was like, that yeah. was a couple of months ago. The Navy just casually said that UFOs were real. Like, <laughs> and everybody oh, just, yeah. we're like, we're busy right now. We'll deal with that after. Yeah, and that was like, that was all of the 90s, <laughs> was that the government was keeping UFOs from us. I know. And, and, it, and now it's like, yeah. Oh and and here's the thing. Here's the thing. So in the 90s, especially, you know, the, the stories were full of, you know, these people usually not in urban areas were abducted. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that ever happened was they would check out the back 40. If you know what I'm saying, the aliens would. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> take. Probe. Uh, yeah. Probe these people and then they yep. put them back. And then apparently it just it just stopped because you never hear that anymore. They're like, we but, you know, a lot of relationships shit. are like that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> only on special occasions. Like it Easter. just then it just stopped. Yeah, it's, it's so Easter exciting anal. at first and then it stops. <laughs> and then 10 years later, the Navy goes, oh, yeah, they're going out still. But let's be honest, if you were an alien and you were monitoring our media, would you want anything to do with us? No. <laughs> I know. You know, it's like people, it's That's like, why won't they come and talk to us? It's like, it's like, we're like a pit with two snakes fighting in it. And the kind of like, you want to go down there? No. Do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> they look, they like, we get it. We get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we get it. Yeah. 
<laughs> you guys are good. <laughs> I've seen enough from here. Yeah. Yeah. So you you did that and 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 that's how you started uh, to get work in uh, the 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 idea that Daphne was used to um I know yeah that's... I hope Warner Brothers doesn't watch this thing. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry oh uh, yeah if, 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 I I have gotten in trouble for my tweets before and then they're like oh really they've they've given up on me oh yeah Nickelodeon I I wrote a tweet about um it was like the Kids Choice Awards time and I said like I just got splattered with. I just got splattered with abortion goo at the kids pro choice awards. Oh, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, you can't say that. Abortion a, ni- goo. A, a nicely worded email was sent out to my agent who forwarded it to me. <laughs> just kidding. Hey Greg, can you delete that tweet please? That's all <laughs> oh, that's knowledge. not bad. Okay. Yeah, they were very nice about it. I had a joke on the Simpsons that I think actually I think actually got into a script <laughs> was uh Dr. Nick the 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 not Doctor Hibbert the kind of low rent doctor was looking through a copy of Our Bodies Ourselves, and he said, uh, "That woman has a baby coming out of her abortion hole." Oh that, my god! That uh, that didn't go, but I did. Uh, I did. I don't want to pat myself on the back. I did have the first on screen suicide in the history of the Simpsons. Oh, but, uh, but you don't want to pat yourself in the yeah. In the guy walks into a lake and. Uh, <laughs> Like in the movie Coming Home, and uh, after the table read, Matt Granny looked at me and he went, 13 seasons without a suicide. Thanks a lot, Dana. <laughs> I love it. I love Matt. He's great. He's a great guy. Um, and and then it's so funny to have, and uh, now your son Tex is, how old now? He's a teenager? He's going to be 14 next month. He's going to be 14? He's, but he's also 30. He's also 58. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's also he gives 58. me all my dating advice too. Like with the people that I'm talking to, he's like, that guy's funny. You need that. You know, he's like, and, 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 uh-huh. like, and no more broke people. No more broke people. You cannot yeah. support anybody anymore. <laughs> That's hard. It's, it's hard though, because I, I don't need anybody I, to be rich. Been, I just need I, to pay their own dinner. That's all. Yeah, I, I'm not even yeah. asking for, you know. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. didn't. I, uh, yeah, I didn't. I went through a bit of that, but you know. That wasn't my, certainly wasn't my marriage. Yeah. Uh, she was uh, far from that. Uh, I the feel opposite like, of that. I feel like there um, has to be something in it for the person to want to spend time. I mean, I'm working on this, but a lot of mm-hmm. times I'm like, what, you know, how can I sweeten this deal for this person to want to spend time with me? They can't possibly just want to spend yeah, time with exactly. me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or you, you go with somebody distant who's like, oh, I, this feels comfortable. They're yeah. not interested in me either. This is great. <laughs> I know. It's yeah. I just showed Tex the Annie Hall for the first time the other night and he and we were, you know, I was like the, whole the scene world. in Annie Hall where he is uh sitting as an adult in the classroom full of children and the girl is accusing him of kissing her doesn't age well. <laughs> I know. Yeah. There's a lot of things in this movie. A lot of things like, don't age yeah. Uh yeah. what's up, Tiger Lily does not age well at all. <laughs> I, I was uh, filling text. The Bill Cosby the album, It's True, It's True, just oh, does not look God. well. Does not look good. Oh, God. We I were watching something. Clueless the other night because my daughter loves Clueless. And yeah. Alicia Silverstone goes, oh, I'm such a retard. Like, oh, yeah. wrong. I know, I know. That's a new one, too. I know. I remember my friend when all that, you know, just just everybody started talking differently. And then I said, yeah. Um, she said, oh, you know, it's so gay, you know, and I said, oh, and she's like, oh, I don't mean like gay, like, like homosexual. I mean, like gay, like retarded. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> ah, like perfect. Yeah, perfect. Was, yeah. No, I don't. Yeah. No, I know. It's it's, uh, it, you know, it's I I don't complain about it because I like I mean, I think yeah, it's, no, it's it's just, a sign yeah. of a healthy society and. Comedians yes. that complain about it, it's just laziness. It's like, okay, yes. so there's a couple more roads, so you have to do a little bit more work. That's all. Yeah. But I yeah, remember, I, I'll give you I'll give you a great, you know, I, it, it takes time, you know, like when when the R word thing came out, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was one of those people that was absolutely like, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and I did a bit about it. That I, my, my last special is a 10-minute bit about the difference between the R word, the N word, and the C word. It was the last yeah. bit in the show. Yeah. And... Now a couple of years go by, and then you go, "Oh no, no, I was totally wrong." Yeah, I definitely. <laughs> yeah, I've learned just, my. Sometimes learned it takes a while. Listen. Like, oh yeah, yeah. no, I was an. I'm the like when you realize like you look back on a situation and go, "Oh, the asshole in this is me." <laughs> yes, oh, yes. oh, terrible. I know. 
But I completely understand because I feel like it's like, oh, it's a joke. We're just – can nobody joke anymore? And it's like, no, it's really hurtful and offensive. Yeah. And, yeah, just work a little harder. Yeah, you yeah. can. Just not that joke. And yeah. listen, yeah. if somebody tells you something, don't go immediately. And I'm just saying it this because I'm guilty. No, of, you're right. Like, you're right. People, yeah. I'm of course immediately you are. Like well, you're worse. You're, fragility, by the way, you know. you're much worse than I am, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I used to I'm not even going to pretend. I'm not even going like, to pretend it. Like I'm the most. I I love everyone. I would never. Ah, and it's like, why don't you shut up for a minute and just listen to what they're saying and just take it in and just say, uh-huh. okay, maybe I can work on that. You know, just that's it's so easy. Just listen to people. Yeah, no, <laughs> without talking for a minute and defending yourself. It's true. So l- l- before you before I let you go, uh, th- you're uh, you you're clearly with your vast real estate holdings the. <laughs> The the pandemic has not bro- broken you in half. Oh, um, I feel so blessed. To, I, I I can't complain. I am homeschooling yeah. three children. I'm a single mother with three children. Now, do they zo- them do they zoom working. in or are they homeschooled? No, I'm okay. Well, I I'm just teaching my little ones. My thir- my my thirteen year old is is zooming, zooming. but he, he can work right. that on his. I'm trying to. to work a little bit i mean i'm working in my little studio and be with the kids yeah well, i'm assuming you can do voiceovers like i know tom kenny has a studio in his house and he's probably yeah. working when this is do- done and the vaccine is out and i'm i'm guessing by summer they said late su- late spring we should be returning yeah to i think daily life. yeah why does why will tom run all over town why can't he just stay at home and zoom in well, that's you know I know now. people I want to be that... at my cabin now and work in my right. little studio if I right. for an hour and then go back to my deck and enjoy yeah. the animals and how many yeah. how many you know and it I mean in a way it's good it'll I, I think a lot of companies will have like you come in two days a week you work from home three days a week to yeah. lighten traffic air quality and things like that mm-hmm. I don't yeah. think things are going to go back to exactly the way they were I think there are yeah. things that you know there are things that I miss I really miss going. To the movies with my kids I on know. Sunday, I which know. was something we always did. And my kids like, and I were talking about it the other day. I was like, "We're gonna, yeah." I said, and, "And now that they're getting a little bit bigger, I'm like, we can actually go eat a nice meal. We can go to a restaurant after. We used to be like, okay, because yeah. you know, my my daughter's gonna be four, but when she was three, it was like, oh God, don't touch that. You know, just I, sure we didn't do that a lot. Um, but and the last movie we saw, I I never get into real movies. A couple times I've been in a had like a little bit thing and here, over here, sure, there. sure. But I was so excited because I got this part in Onward, that new Pixar movie. I was the, right, yeah, the, like. <sighs> And so I'm like, yeah, and finally in a movie in a real theater, you know, we're going to go. And we did. That was the last movie we ever saw in the theater. <laughs> Thank God. Right. But I was like, of course, the world is not that it's all about me. I know. That no, I know. But, but I take dead, your point. It's, like, it's, yeah. a, it's so a, it really is. It's a good the, point. The real tragedy is that I my movie got cut short. That's, <laughs> it's not the deaths. Um, yeah, it's no, not the deaths. It's, you know. I was trying to tell my friend about like the the positives of I'm like you know we've been doing a lot of baking with the kids I, you know I used to travel all the time you know for and now I'm home and and she was like yes rich white lady tell me about all the benefits <laughs> of the quarantine that I know there's three hundred thousand people are dead but please tell me about the baking you've been doing and the bread. <laughs> um, this was so fun. It was so good to see you. Thank you so much for uh, have a great holiday yes. and uh, hope maybe we'll see each other outside at I some can't point. Wait, I want to. Other podcasts reach for the sky. David Goldbaum. We barely try. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom! Peace out. Peace out.